work session to order at 9 a.m. on Thursday, June the 10th. And I wanna welcome everyone here today. My dear colleagues, our wonderful staff and everyone who may be listening as well. We're so glad to have everyone with us. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Sewell. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freelon. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Councilmember Middleton. I am here. Councilmember Reese. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Colleagues, I want to start uh, with just a couple of quick um, announcements uh, or comments. One is that, uh, as Mayor Pro Tem uh, said, as we got started here, we're in the home stretch. And um, I, I spoke to the manager yesterday, and she is asking, we know that it is our job here today to try to solve all of the questions that we have before us in terms of the budget so that we're not doing anything on Monday night, the 21st. Um, so we've got a, we don't have a lot of items, but we have a few items we need to settle for the budget. And, um, but I hope we'll all keep that in mind. That's certainly what I'll try to help us do. And, and, uh, but the manager did again, especially a re request that I remind you all of that. Uh, our job today is to get through these budget items so that on the 21st, uh, we will have a budget that is ready to be voted on. And, uh, you know, occasionally something has to come up at the last minute, but let's try to avoid that if we can. Uh, the second thing that the manager and I talked about when we, we were going through the list of things today uh, is we had a brief discussion of the request that the uh, folks from the master aging plan had made. And um, the, um, what we, uh, decided to recommend to you all today, uh, it, it, because that's something that we all care about. Uh, but let me, let me just set the table a little bit. The staff had not uh, had any report on that, any information on that prior to the, to the very, very recent things that we've heard, uh, nor have we as the council heard a report on the master aging plan. Uh, the, the commission, the county commission, I know has been taking it up. Uh, but our thought, uh, and I'll recommend this to you just for your uh, thumbs up or down, uh, is that we would uh, not discuss that this morning. The staff has no analysis to offer, no information, but that we uh, hold that uh, for a future time that we ask the Master Aging Plan folks to come to the council to make a presentation at the work session. And that if we would like to fund that later in the year, it would not be a large amount of money, but we could make that decision at that time. So that was my recommendation and the manager's recommendation, but I wanna just check that with you all. I see one thumb from council member Reese. Do, do I see some other thumbs? Okay, everybody's good, I think. Madam manager, so I think we're settled on that item. Uh, yes, council member Caballero. I, my one request is that we hear it on the earlier side of the new fiscal year. So, you know, early fall versus December-ish. Yes, noted and um, I'm sure that our staff can make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I believe those are all the things that we needed to do at the beginning. And uh, Council Member Reese? I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Trying to figure out how to mute myself. There it is. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good, good morning, colleagues. Um, I really felt like I should just say at the outset of this meeting uh, how much I appreciate your patience and grace with me earlier this week as I communicated to each of you. Uh, my, one of my kids experienced a health emergency late Monday evening that prevented my participation in our last meeting. I uh, hate that. That's always a sick feeling uh, when that happens, um, but I'm happy to report that I invested some time over the last couple of days to watch the uh, meeting, uh, so I was able to uh, receive all the public input um, although not at the same time of day that y'all did. Um, and I just wanted to thank you for, uh, for shouldering the burden uh, at that meeting in my absence. Uh, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Council member, we are just glad uh, that you were able to spend the time that you needed to with family and that uh, things have settled down and that um, all is well. So thank you for thank you for your comments and uh, we're always glad to do that. All right, we'll now turn to our staff uh, and I'm, I believe that I will call on Mr. Allure uh, our first discussion is the premium pay and bonuses. Uh, Mr. Allure. Uh, good morning, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council. Just ask briefly that the agenda be put up on your screen just so you know what you're getting into this morning. Uh, yes, we, we will have um, a couple of presentations, one from uh, the HR department, one from the Durham County. Um, and uh, sandwiched in between there is a, a brief discussion um, on emergency communications facilitated by Bo Ferguson, Deputy, uh, Assist or, uh, Deputy City Manager Bo Ferguson. And then uh, for the remainder of the meeting, we'll toward, turn towards the, the other business you have noted here, uh, bulleted here, and any other uh, business you'd like to attend to um, <clears throat> for this morning's uh, follow-up work session. And with, with that, if, if the City Manager has any remarks, I'll turn it to her. Good, good morning, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the Durham City Council. My remarks will be brief. Uh, I would like to thank our uh, Budget Management Services Department, as well as our departments for working since we last were in session to bring <clears throat> additional information to you on items that you wanted to continue to discuss today. Uh, we look forward to taking your final direction and completing this budget. And finally, I would I'd like to welcome uh, Interim uh, County Manager Hager to this meeting who will be making a presentation um, for us. And I look forward to working with her as we both complete our bu budgets and talk about the uh, very large increases that we're gonna receive coming to our community from the federal government. So that will be all that I would uh, present this morning. Thank you very much, Madam Manager. And with that, I'll turn things over to uh, Director uh, Youngblood to give you an HR uh, update. Good morning, uh, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the City Council. I was asked to prepare a presentation to give you some additional options on premium pay and pay for performance budgets. And that is what I will go through today. Next slide, please. To provide a little bit of context and history, I wanted to make sure that we understood the, the, the genesis of premium pay and premium pay history for the city of Durham. So at the beginning of the pandemic, the city wanted to recognize employees with a heightened uh, risk exposure to COVID-19. Departments determined which employees would be eligible for premium pay based on a shared set of guidelines that were established through a temporary premium pay policy. Employees uh, who were deemed eligible for premium pay received 5% of salary from March 30th, 2020 through June 19th, 2020. And the total amount for salaries paid out in premium pay for FY20 was approximately $808,000. What you see on the screen now are four different options for premium pay. The first option reflects what has already been recommended in the city manager's budget. That is a continuation of the 5% of salary without any additional compensation for a total of $3.9 million. The second option builds upon the original recommendation. In addition to the 5% of salary, we are, we are recommending an option two that employees receive an additional lump sum payment of $1,250. The cost differential between option one and option two is approximately $1.9 million. And the total cost for option two is about $5.8 million. Option three is a variation on option two. We continue with the 5% salary uh, payment, premium payment. And we provide here in option three, differentiated lump sum bonuses based on the employee's salary. 
the additional cost from option three compared to option one, which is a part of the original budget recommendation, is about $987,125 for a total cost of about $4.9 million. Option four is a variation of option three, which is 5% salary uh, premium pay with larger bonuses that are differentiated, again, based on the same salary break points as in the previous option. The additional cost for option four compared to option one is about $1.97 million and a total cost of $5.9 million. This slide provides you a summary of the, the various premium pay options by pay group. As you can see, by and large, general employees would receive the largest amount of the total of premium pay across the different options with not insignificant amounts going to both police and fire. And there's also money within each of the options for part-time employees who would meet the eligibility criteria for premium pay. Moving now from P premium pay to pay for performance uh, bonuses. I'm sorry, Regina, could you go back to that last slide just for just for a minute? Yes. Thank you. Just needed a minute to look at it. Okay, now moving from the topic of premium pay to pay for performance uh, budget options, excuse me, pay for performance uh, lump sum options for employees. Uh, we have three options on this slide. Option A reflects what is currently recommended in the budget, which are differentiated pay for performance bonuses based on various salary breakpoints for a total of $3.1 million in cost. Option B, increases those established pay for performance bonuses by about 50%. And then option C doubles the pay for performance bonus options. And so as you can see, uh, increasing the options by 50% yields a total cost of about $4.7 million and doubling the bonus options is, is basically double option A, $6.3 million. Next slide. Again, breaking down those options by pay group, general employees, again, receiving the greatest amount of the pay, pay for performance bonuses, police and fire, and part-time individuals being eligible. Now this is a representation of the cost of pay performance bonuses by fund. Uh, general fund would bear most of the cost of the pay performance budget uh, um, for these bonuses. Option A uh, is $2.3 million, option B $3.5 million, and option C $4.6 million. And I just noticed the note that popped in. You, you may wonder why we did not break down the premium pay by fund. Uh, the premium pay will not have any impact on the fund since the premium pay will be coming from the ARP funding. And the last slide is really just meant to provide a sample employee impact for consideration, depending on which options we pick for premium pay and bonus. Uh, there could be a number of variations that would yield very different results. So using a sample employee, we have some assumptions uh, on the slide. This would be an example of a sworn police officer full-time with a base salary of $55,000. Uh, the assumption is that this individual is eligible for premium pay and would meet the criteria to receive the pay for performance budgets be, uh, bonus because uh, he or she received an effective or better performance rating. I'll walk you through option 1A. 
Uh, the raise uh, that the individual will receive is reflective of the structure adjustment that is being recommended for the police pay plan of 4%. So that raise amount would be $2,200. The individual would then receive premium pay at 5% of the salary, which is $2,750. In option A, there is no premium plus bonus, but the pay for performance bonus for this individual would be $1,250 based on the salary of $55,000 for a total payout of $6,200, which is approximately 11.3% increase in the for the employee. Option 3B, the raise and the premium pay would be the same, but here's where we start to see some variation in the premium bonus and option B, we're assuming that we would give an individual a flat amount bonus in addition to premium pay ranging from $500 to $750, depending upon the person's salary. Based on this person's salary of $55,000, they would get a $625 additional premium pay bonus. And for pay for performance, uh, we have bonus amounts of $1,500 to $2,250 in this particular option. And based on that person's salary, they would get a pay for performance bonus of $1,875 for a total payout of $7,450, rep representing approximately a 13.5% increase for the employee. And an option for C, again, premium pay and raises would be the same. We have larger amounts of budgeted or recommended in this particular option for premium plus payment. So the premium plus payment would be $1,250 because those uh, payments would vary from $1,000 to $1,500 based on person's salary. And their pay for performance bonus would range from $2,000 to $3,000 depending on the salary. And this particular individual would receive $2,500 for a total payout of $8,700 reflecting approximately 15.8% increase. I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation, Ms. Youngblood. And uh, we really appreciate this work. Thank you so much. Uh, there were questions that Councilmember Reese had in the chat, which the manager uh, has answered. I just want to make sure everyone else saw that, um, which is regarding the source of the funds. Councilmember Reese, are you satisfied with that? Yeah. All right. Questions from Ms. Youngblood? All right. Uh, if there are no questions, uh, comments at this time? Okay, uh, Council Member Middleton and right. then Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, everyone. Good to see y'all. So I, the, I guess the impetus was a, a, a feeling that we could do more. So I, I guess the, the assignment before us is to decide whether or not we're going to do more. Um, yes, that is exactly. That is okay, the assignment. Just, just wanted, and, it was a little silent when you asked for it. Okay, but, yeah. uh, all right. That, that's, that's the assignment, easier. right. Okay, got you. So, <laughs> I'm done, I yield back. <laughs> yeah, and we need to figure out, um, we, we um, as you know, we have the recommendation before us, uh, which the, 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 uh, the, the which is the pay for the, the, the pay plan uh, structure adjustments and the bonus plan and the premium pay. Uh, we have three things that the administration has recommended to us just to refresh everybody. Uh, the premium pay, uh, I believe that the, we were informed by management would go to about 1,100 uh, employees. Is that correct, Ms. Youngblood? Uh, do you have an estimate on that? That is correct. It's a little bit more than that. A little bit more than 1,100. So, our the frontline employees, uh, the 1,100 frontline employees, uh, who would receive the extra five percent for uh, in retroactive uh, for uh, premium pay. There's the bonuses that are on the uh, sliding scale relative to uh, how th three different breakpoints in terms of how much people are 
earning, and then there's the uh, pay structure adjustments. And so now we're being asked uh, if we are, we, we asked the administration to show us some other things so that we could decide if there was something more that we wanted to do. So uh, any questions or comments? Mayor May Pote? I ask, I'm sorry, this one. May okay. I ask within the yeah. context, so with the proposed tax increases that are already in play, obviously we haven't approved the budget yet, what, what, what are the implications or impacts on, on revenues and uh, within, within if, if everything else was left the same and we chose the top option? Could, could Budget of Finance talk to me a little bit about the potential impacts? So I will uh, begin, um, council members. The bonus payments are one-time payments. So those payments, uh, come from a source. And in the case of premium pay, um, the amount that is approved from premium pay for bonuses reduces the total that we have left to invest in other, in, you know, other kinds of things that are priorities. So <clears throat> we have uh, received about half of our um, first tranche of our ARC funding. Uh, it is about $25 million dollars. And we have only requested at this point officially uh, the premium pay as uh, one of the uses of that. So the original uh, amount that we had requested for that, I believe, I don't, I keep a lot of numbers in my head, but I believe it's about $3.9 million. And so that 25 million would fund the 3.9. As you increase that, then the 25 million that we have would go down by that, by that amount. And that is only for premium pay. Um, there's, a, there's a little bit more impact in the uh, regular bonus because the regular bonus increases uh, are coming from our fund balances in the funds that the employees work in. So, that was the reason Ms. Youngblood showed the funds that the employees actually work in so that the council could see uh, that those, those bonus amounts would be coming from those fund balances one time. Uh, majority of it, you know, certainly most of our employees work in the general fund. So that's where the biggest impact is for the bonuses. There's no proposal that you see in front of you today that is going to really change the tax increase that's recommended because the tax increase is funding primarily the salary adjustments. Those are the adjustments that we have to carry forward uh, into our multi-year plans. That's helpful. Thank you, Madam Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, council member. Thank you, Madam Manager. Uh, colleagues, I do wanna point out two things that, uh, or one thing that I think is worth of, worth consideration. I'm gonna state this and then Ms. Youngblood, you can tell me if I'm right or not. Uh, the, the, one of the choices we have if we were to make some changes here is that the, the premium pay, uh, an increase in premium pay would be for part of our workforce. And that, you know, the 1100 plus that we talked about earlier. Uh, a pay for performance bonus would be across the workforce and everyone would receive a benefit. Is that correct, Ms. Youngblood? That is 99% um, correct. So a pay for performance bonus would be, everyone would be eligible for it if they are pay for performance eligible. So there are some individuals that might be in their probationary status who would not be eligible for a pay for performance increase. And also the pay for performance increase is contingent upon that person's actual performance. And if they've received a performance rating less than effective, then they would not be eligible. But the broader reach, uh, it definitely is there for the pay for performance increase. It is eligible for a lot more employees than just the premium pay. And I've got the updated premium pay number for you. It's 1,361 full-time employees, 59 part-time, and then there's an additional 175 people that might be partially eligible based on the nature of the work that they did during the time period. Thank you. So that sounds like it's just a little more than half of our workforce, roughly. roughly. All right, colleagues, any comments? Uh, anyone want to offer thoughts at this time or any more questions for Ms. Youngblood? 
Council Member Caballero, and then Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I just had some questions. So I know that the salary adjustments, and I forgot what it was for general employees, it's two or two and a half percent. It's two. Uh, okay. And that's to alleviate part of the step plan prop issue that we're going to hit more significantly next year, because we're not giving enough of an increase to, to follow the formula that we had set before. So, um, Typically, what we were planning on doing uh, prior to COVID for our step plan was to make sure that we adjusted it every other year. Okay. We know that the, the, the market cost of labor increases about 2% per year. And so we are behind in adjusting. Um, and even though we are going to move the structure 2% in this next budget, that would mean that we're still behind the market increases by two years, yeah, by 2%. And so the, our plan was to also adjust the open range every single year. And that means we're about 6% then behind the market, but we're going to move the, the open range about 7%, but the individuals within the open range plan are getting a 2% across the board uh, increase to their base. Okay. Thank you. Does this, I mean, the pay for performance, I mean, this does at least alleviate, I know it doesn't help us in the long term, but it does alleviate the feel, you know, what employees are feeling in their paycheck. It does offset some of it uh, if, if it doesn't correct completely for the long term. That's correct. So they, they're going to feel a lot more money at one time in their pockets, uh, but because we're not fully funding the pay for performance plan with step increases or full pay for performance increases, individuals will have a lower, a feeling of a lower earning potential over time because only some of the money that they're gonna get this year will go into their base to be multiplied and added to over time. Okay, thank you. And then one final question. We received an email, I feel like just a few days ago from, um, and again, it's about firefighter pay. I feel like some city staff was on this email yeah, uh, manager page is on it. And I just happy to forward it, but just wanted some um, commentary on, on what was shared that basically there wasn't a, uh, a cost to the city to add the 5% merit raise. We don't need to discuss it. I, I don't even know if you've had the opportunity to see it, but I, I did want to flag it and happy to forward it to you, um, Regina. Thank you. Thank you. I have I have seen it, but I am not prepared with any comments uh, related to it today. Uh, what I what I can say is um, it takes an oversimplified view of the impact to the city's multi year, and I would feel more comfortable with budget explaining the impacts to the multi year plan. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, obviously, when you're dealing with pay for performance, it's a more complex issue that does affect. Uh, not only current revenues in order to balance an increase for that, but as, as Regina and both the, the city manager have pointed out, it has multi-year implications and an, an, infl an inflating factor to it. Thank you. Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanna express my thoughts on what we should do. Um, and I think that it would be great for us to increase the amounts in the budget for both premium pay um, and pay per performance bonuses to the highest amounts that are recommended by the administration. Um, and I think that that's reasonable for a couple, a couple of reasons. Um, I, feel, I feel a concern about um, us not, us not following the plan that we put in place um, back in 2019. And that's, you know, that a lot of that is beyond our control. We had COVID, we had um, an economic downturn that impacted the city significantly. Um, I think that, you know, we understand that our employees understand that, but I think that we should do as much as we can to, um, we should do as much as we can to make up for that with the one-time money that we have access to with what, as much as we can, as much as we feel that we can afford. Um, we, you know, the, these bonuses aren't going to, you know, as Regina said, add to the employee's base pay over time. Um, they're not, they're not the raises that we 
promise, but I think that they will go a long way toward supporting our employees um, and making folks feel like their work is valued, putting a little bit of extra money in their pocket and, you know, do, doing all that we can with the one-time money because we don't have the recurring funds that we would need um, to, to, to advance the pay plan that we originally, um, that we originally promised our employees. And the other reason is that this year has just been really bad <laughs> for everybody. Um, and I think that us doing all that we can um, for our staff is the right thing to do. And it sets the right example for the community um, at large that, that this is an important time for us to be supporting workers. Um, and I want us to do as much as we can, you know, as much as we can afford. And so I, I think the highest recommendation from the staff um, is reasonable and I would support us increasing, uh, doing, doing option four for the premium pay and doing option C for the performance bonuses. Thanks. And let me just try to put a number on that. What I, just so we can have some context, what I think, Ms. Youngblood, and you can correct me, is that uh, the, we, we would be talking about approximately another $3.1 million in the pay for performance bonuses and approximately another $2 million in the premium pay option. So we'd be in the five point something million dollars additional in one-time payments. And just to keep, make sure I again, continue to understand that with the, the premium pay money, the approximately 2 million, um, that money would come out of ARP funds and the uh, pay per performance bonuses, the approximately 3 million additional would come from the various fund balances from the uh, funds from which, for, to whom the money, the departments to whom the money would go. Is that right? Did I get that right? You did. Exactly. Right. Correct. Okay. Colleagues, uh, Council Member Freeland. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to uh, echo what um, Mayor Pro Tem Johnson just said. And also, you know, coming off of Tuesday's budget healing event at North Carolina Central we did some brainstorming and some dreaming and visioning around the, the American Rescue Plan funds. And there are like five pillars. The, the, it's actually quite broad what types of things this money can go to, but they, you know, they, they gave us kind of five pillars to determine kind of where to make these investments. And one of the ones where it was very clear was provide premium pay for essential workers. So I, you know, this, I just wanted to emphasize that this feels really in alignment with the purpose and intent uh, of those monies. And um, uh, yeah, I support going as far as is as feasible. Um, and that does, you know, and we have another 25 million coming next year uh, to do some of the other things that we want to do. I, I think we'll still be able to do that. So I just wanted to chime in on that front. Thank you, council member. Maybe one other check-in would be uh, important. Um, Mr. Allure, the general fund, uh, can you remind us what our plans are for the, 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 the great majority of the, um, the, the funds for the, um, the, the, the really significant impact for performance bonus cost options uh, for performance bonus increases would be from the general fund um, would be from the general fund fund balance. We are already planning to spend about 2.3 million, as I read this, out of the general fund fund balance for performance bonus cost option for performance bonus. If we added another 2.3 million out of the general fund balance, why don't you remind us what our plan general fund balance is? Um, uh, you know, th that we would be taking out at what, how, you know, we would be reducing that. We would still have a significant balance, but can you remind us of that amount? Yes. Um, so when we, when we did, uh, when we did budget briefing, what we had uh, coming out of fund balance was $2.9 million for one-time bonuses. Okay. So increase that by that amount and 
so what we're, we're, we're doing, and there's some other adjustments obviously, but what you originally saw was about the use of $10.4 million from fund balance in FY22. Uh, uh, with some other adjustments, that's going to increase it by mm, about 14 to 15 million from fund balance. And uh, your, your surplus amount that we were projecting was 23.6 million above and beyond the 16.7. So there is comfortable capacity. Great. Colleagues, just to remind us, the 16.7% is, is our goal. This would put us still 20 million or so above the, that, that goal. So um, I think what I'll do now is I'll accept a motion and then we can con continue discussion. So to give the council, to give our, our, our management some direction, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd move that we include um, option four as our premium pay bonus and option C as our pay per performance bonus in our 2021-22 uh, budget. Second. Moved by council, by Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, seconded by Council Member Middleton uh, that we, can you say it again, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, I'm, I don't have that slide pulled up. Yep, that we approve option four for premium pay and option C for pay for, per, pay for performance bonuses uh, in the budget. All right, and that was seconded by Council Member Middleton. Other discussion, colleagues? Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be supporting the motion um, when it comes time to vote. Just briefly wanted to thank Council Member Freelon, uh, who at our um, budget work session, I guess two weeks ago, asked staff to come back with these options. Um, and want to thank staff for working hard in the interim to put together a set of plans that let us kind of figure out what we want to do. Um, you know, the mayor pro tem said it really well. This is the tension we have between uh, investing in uh, base pay, uh, which, which implicates the use of recurring funds versus these kinds of bonus options uh, that um, use one-time funds that put additional money in our employees' pockets, but don't make any additional progress um, in the step plan that we were forced to, um, to skip over in the last budget cycle. Um, I just wanted to add one note, uh, which is that I, I don't want us to get caught up in the passive voice when it comes to our inability to invest more recurring funds in base pay. Uh, these are. This is a choice that all of us are making, um, and it's a choice that I support. But it means, but the choice that we're making to uh, to not make additional investments in base pay through the use of recurring funds means that that in order to improve the financial situation of our employees, this is this is the kind of thing we have to do. Um, I support, as I said, I support that choice uh, because. There are lots of other things we want to do, but I think it puts an especially specific burden on this council and the administration in our next budget to make sure that we take the steps that are necessary uh, to get us back on track with base pay. And so uh, I just wanted to put a fine point on that. I, I know that, that um, we've heard from a number of employees who are frustrated uh, by this issue who don't see one-time money as uh, especially meaningful. Um, and I want to say that I acknowledge that. Uh, but given the choices that we have all made to get to this point, I think the path that the mayor pro tem has sketched with this and the, and the supporting information from staff, it gives us a path forward. Um, and I, I will be supporting it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, council member. Any more comments? Okay. Uh, I think I will make one, which is um, I certainly agree about the base pay and the need to, we need to make that right. We need to get with our plan and we need to make sure that next year that's a top priority. Uh, I will say though that um, this is a huge positive hit to the pocketbooks of our employees. Huge. Uh, the, the, a, uh, uh, this, the example we have is for 50, as a, an employee who's paid $55,000. A 40, a, an employee paying, being paid $40,000 uh, 
you know, the, the, the increase to their pay for this year will be, you know, in the 20 something percent range. This is a large amount of money in the pockets of our employees. And I think it's, it's great. I'm very supportive. All right, colleagues, uh, any further discussion? Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Mayor Shule? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson? Aye. Councilmember Caballero? Aye. Councilmember Freelon? Aye. Councilmember Freeman? Aye. Councilmember Middleton? I vote aye. Councilmember Reese? Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Youngblood, thank you. Thank you and allow me to please say thank you for all the hard work of my team that worked on all of these scenarios. I'm uh, pleased with the final result, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, uh, we'll now move to uh, Mr. Ferguson, uh, unless Mr. Allure has any more comments. No additional comments. All right, uh, colleagues, uh, we welcome both Ferguson. Uh, you all will remember that uh, there were questions raised about any potential implications of the 911 uh, needs, staffing needs uh, for our budget. And Mr. Ferguson is here to give us a brief report on that, and then we can discuss it. Welcome, Mr. Ferguson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, I'm Bo Ferguson, Deputy City Manager for Operations. We also have 911 Director Randy Beeman with us this morning. Um, I want to thank you for this opportunity to answer any questions you may have about the fiscal year 2022 proposed budget and how it pertains to the 911 uh, uh, budget uh, and staffing concerns there. But since this is the first public conversation we've had with the council since some concerns have been raised, I, I just wanted to start off by saying this. Uh, Durham's 911 center is staffed. Uh, it is taking 911 calls, 100% of the 911 calls from Durham residents. Durham residents should feel confident in calling 911 when they have a need for assistance. That assistance is being provided. Those calls are being answered. Public safety is being maintained in Durham. And I want to offer reassurances that that is happening now. And there is an intensive effort to ensure that we will continue to address our vacancies to ensure that that continues into the future and that we improve our ability to maintain appropriate staffing in the center. Um, I, I want uh, anyone who's listening to understand that confidence and to make sure that they call 911 when they need help, that call will be answered. That being said, I want to acknowledge that uh, concerns uh, about our staffing level are understandable and legitimate, uh, and that there is an intensive effort now to re-examine uh, our recruitment and training process to ensure uh, that we have the best process possible to fill vacancies with highly trained, well-prepared call takers and dispatchers to make sure that we continue to provide this important service to Durham residents. Uh, with that, you know, I, I do wanna offer one historical note. Um, we are currently at a staffing level in the 911 center that is commensurate with where we were in the middle of summer of last year. Um, our low point over the last 12 months in staffing occurred in November, and we have been on a steady upward trajectory since November. Again, that is not to minimize concerns about, about the vacancy level we have now, but to offer assurances that we are at a place uh, that, is, that is similar to where we were a year ago and definitely improved over our low points in the center. Um, with that, I want to just provide that as, as an introductory uh, 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 table setting uh, and then see what uh, questions council may have about the budget, answer any questions about our recruitment efforts, uh, see what other discussion council would like to have today. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Ferguson. And I'll now uh, ask for questions, council member Reese or comments. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wanna thank Deputy City Manager Ferguson for giving us that report. Also wanna appreciate uh, the staff's willingness to add this on the agenda today. Uh, I guess my perspective on this is guided by something my father always said. It's, it's not always true, but um, he, he likes to say there are very few problems that can't be solved by the application of mere money. Um, that is 100 percent true, uh, as, as I've learned in my 50 odd years uh, on the earth. But uh, but when it comes to something like this, uh, it does feel like some of these problems can be solved by the application of mere money. Um, but maybe it would be helpful for me at least to understand 
um, why the administration did or did not feel it necessary to come forward with a um, a a budget adjustment uh, to the this particular department in light of the staffing uh, problems. Um, it's it just seems to me that 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 maybe some of this can be solved by paying people more money, or offering more money, or doing more. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not an expert at this. Uh, but but it seems like if we have trouble hiring people to do this job, maybe we're not offering enough money to people to do the job. Help me understand why I'm wrong about that, and maybe maybe just a little bit of how we got into this situation. Um, because that might help us figure out how, how the how or not not at all the council can be helpful in uh, in resolving it. Thank you, Councilmember Reese. Those are uh, extremely reasonable questions and assumptions, and and I'm happy for the chance to to walk through them. But let me start with the end of your question first and sort of work backwards. Um, the I, I'm going to talk in a few generalizations. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more detail to this, but but the question about how we got here. I think is at a high level to say that um, we have we have experienced a high number of vacancies in this department somewhat persistently over the last three to four years. It's not a problem that that happened um, all at once and from one cause. Uh, and we were in a maintenance mode that was filling the vacancies at a rate that was fast enough not to take a, a serious downturn. Um, that. Uh, that system uh, did not work as well in, uh, in the last 12 months. Uh, and primarily that is more people left than historically have been leaving. Uh, and we did not have uh, one training academy that we traditionally have in the course of a calendar year as a result of implications from COVID. Uh, and that put us in a hole uh, in late 2020, late calendar year 2020, uh, that, that resulted in, a, I think, some of the more acute concerns that, that are now widely known. Um, the, what that tells us is this. We have had a consistent, repetitive training program, and there is, a, there is an ongoing training program that, that runs in our 911 center. And I think the simple answer to your question is we, needed, we need a bigger pipeline to get people through that system to fill vacancies faster. We have not seen that our salaries, our benefits um, are a negative factor in filling vacancies. We get enough applications when we apply for them, uh, but we have identified that our training, uh, that our training regimen does not move enough people through at one time. As we have said very publicly you know, over the last month, it is critical that these staff be trained appropriately and thoroughly, uh, and that takes time and that takes very intensive uh, uh, interactions between the trainer and the trainee. So it is, it is something that does not scale easily. We can't just double the size of a class. Uh, and, you know, and in this scenario, we, we have a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention, two-on-one -on -one attention for our trainees. Uh, and, and those are some of the reasons, although I, I freely admit they are probably inadequate reasons for why uh, we did not put effort into scaling up this program sooner. Um, but all of that comes to me, I think, to, to the final answer to your question is m money has not been a, uh, the lack of resources has not been an inhibitor on this. This, this budget, when fully funded, allows us to have the, the positions we need on the floor I think it allows us to pay those staff appropriately. Um, but what we need to do better is make sure that when we have applications, we can take more of those applications in a fiscal year, move them through the training process and get them on the floor. And that is where our efforts are uh, very keenly focused right now. Uh, and we have made a number of changes over the last six weeks in terms of that program, both in terms of uh, positions that we are recruiting for now uh, and plans for the rest of this fiscal year that we are confident are going to address this issue. Um, that does not mean that we are not continuing to look at, uh, at every possibility to ensure that we are both moving people into these positions quickly, 
um, and also that we are treating our existing employees appropriately and making sure that we have an environment that supports them, uh, encourages them to, to stay with our organization. And so those are an additional set of conversations. I'd like to publicly thank uh, the partnership of our human resources department who has been uh, right at Randy's side over the last six weeks and, and, and at my side, talking through every, you know, all possible options and scenarios and, and those are being looked at. Um, we will not hesitate to bring a request to the city manager uh, if we feel like it's in the best interest of this department and if we feel like there's a good opportunity uh, for funding or for our policy consideration uh, to address that concern. So hopefully that, that addresses your question. If there's a part of your question I didn't get to, please let me know and I'm happy to be more specific about it. Well, thanks, Bill. I appreciate that. That, um, that helps. Um, I guess I, um, yeah, no, that helps. So I, 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 I trust that uh, that the administration will come forward if they need additional resources, um, and I trust this this council uh, understands that there's very little that should be a higher priority than making sure that when our residents call nine one one that their calls are answered appropriately. Um, I guess the two things: one, Bo, I just want to thank you for your personal involvement over the last. I guess month and a half, two months, I know that you have been uh, personally very deeply involved in trying to find solutions to the situation at, at the DECC and, and that you've been kind of physically co-located there with them for some time. So I just want to thank you for your personal involvement and your attention. Um, I don't know a more competent uh, and skilled administrator um, in local government. And I, and I know that, that your direct involvement is one of the reasons why we've gotten back on track so quickly. So thank you for that. And I hope you don't take my questions as any kind of criticism or view of the work that you've done. Absolutely not. Um, the other thing I want to ask, which is not strictly speaking budget related, but is a form of accountability for myself uh, and for the city broadly. Can you help me remember when, uh, when we developed the capacity to automatically switch call response from our call center to other jurisdictions like, uh, like Wake County? I, I know that we we did we made some technological upgrades that made that uh, process more or less seamless in terms of uh, folks uh, in terms of transferring the call responsibility. But I'm wondering when we actually obtained the ability to do that in the way that it happened that it has happened recently. Thank you. Uh, so the answer to that question, Council Member, is. Uh, the, the state of North Carolina has a highly coordinated uh, 911 system. Uh, I'm pleased to say, I think, I, I think it is one of the most advanced 911 systems in the country, and, and it's looked to by a number of other states uh, for uh, advances that are intended to, to serve the public and provide a robust system. The state uh, has been advancing an architecture for 911 systems called the EziNet. Uh, which is a coordinated call answering uh, system that is managed across the state to provide primarily a, a robust network and a hosted solution outside of 911 centers that manages the incoming 911 calls in a community and dictates where those calls go, how they are presented uh, in 911 call centers uh, and, and, uh, and the various factors that affect those calls. Um, that transition has been taking place with all public safety answering points, PSAPs, 911 centers, is, is, those terms are a bit interchangeable, across North Carolina with the goal of moving 100% of the centers uh, to this system. Durham was proud to be the first uh, PSAP on that network, and we made that transition just about at the same time that we moved into the new 911 center in the police headquarters. So. Uh, that was roughly around 2018, and I apologize, I don't remember the exact date that we made the cutover. When we made that transition, one of the key features of that new system is the ability for various 911 centers to back up other 911 centers. Um, that is envisioned to be used in a variety of scenarios. Um, you, know, you might think the most likely scenario would be the incapacitation of a center, uh, in particular, the system has been used when major hurricanes have moved in uh, and there has been a concern about the viability of 911 centers on the coast. Uh, it has been used to route 100% of calls uh, from 911 centers to other 911 centers. 
That is how the capability came about. That is how we became eligible for that capability. And uh, that's the capability that was implemented uh, at the end of 2020 when we hit a severe staffing shortage. Great. Um, thanks a lot uh, for all that information. I think it's really important that we kind of have this public conversation about what's happened um, and what we're doing to fix it. Um, and I just want to thank again staff uh, for making room this morning for that. Um, Mr. Mayor, I don't have any additional questions uh, except again to reiterate that there, uh, that uh, I'm ready to do whatever it takes to continue to solve this problem. I trust the administration is doing what there is to do. Uh, and, uh, and just wanted to make sure that they know that we're here uh, to do whatever, whatever we need to do. Uh, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for those important questions. I'm glad that uh, you raised them. Uh, other colleagues, questions for Mr. Ferguson. Council Member Freeman and then Council Member uh, Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, um, I just wanted to note, I think I raised the issue a few years ago about our call center employees and just acknowledging that they're not included as first responders. And I think that that's a miss, acknowledging how much work they're doing on the front line and um, just how important their job is. I think this last uh, turn of events demonstrates what that looks like. And I think I wanna lean in on when you said more people left than traditionally leave. I'm gonna imagine that that has a lot to do with the pandemic and working in an office or in a call center um, around the clock all day, every day. And uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the nature of the work that they're doing is a first respond as a first responder, is, it needs to be classified as first responder. Thank you. Uh, um, I don't have uh, meaningful data to speak to about higher uh, than usual departures. I certainly wouldn't refute uh, your presumptions about what might have been involved in their thinking on that. Uh, certainly, um, these are these are critical public safety personnel, uh, and um, yeah, I, I I think it's important that we acknowledge their role in in providing public safety, and, and I think we try as an administration and certainly within the leadership of the 911 Center to acknowledge and speak about the critical role these employees play in, in providing uh, life-saving services uh, to the residents of Durham. Uh, we, I think we just recently, the council uh, um, acknowledged them in a resolution uh, on, on uh, 911 Telecommunicators Week. Um, and, and I think any opportunity we have to raise up the importance and the critical nature of this work is, is one we need to take advantage of. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, colleagues. Both, thank you so much. Good to see you. And I don't see Randy. I want to thank him uh, as well. I, I want to start off sort of piggybacking on, on a, a sentiment that Councilor, uh, Council Member Freeman has raised. First, I just want to thank uh, those who are working our emergency communication center, those, those call takers. Um, it is hard to describe how stressful a job it is. Uh, and I've only sat with them for a few times and listened to calls. I mean, the, sometimes the imagination can be worse than what's actually going on in real life. And oftentimes they're left to, to imagine what's going on. I mean, sitting there and hearing uh, a scuffle, someone calling for help, a scream, and then silence. And you hear somebody moving in a room or a shot and then silence. Um, I just want to thank them. They are first responders, whether we designate them or not, they are de facto first responders, but we know they're also part of a nexus. There, there's, there's, there's an ecosystem, a relationship between them and the resources that they dispatch. Uh, when folk call in uh, to keep good faith with them, we have to do our part to make sure that once the call comes, that whatever needs to be sent is, is there, it's working, they're, they're equipped, they're professionally trained, um, and they're the best in the business. Um, I was really looking forward to this, this conversation, Bo, because this, this perhaps, uh, you know, as you move about the city, this is perhaps the most or one of the most anxiety producing issues amongst our citizenry and our residents. Um, and there's a lot of things going on, uh, you know, in the city right now. So this coupled with that has been one of the most anxiety uh, producing uh, issues uh, for our citizens. So I, I want to thank the call takers. I want to thank 
uh, the leadership uh, of our emergency communication center. And I wanna, I wanna drill down and ask a, a question because one of the, and let, let me firstly say with respect to the money issue, you know, and this is, this is not scientific, this is purely anecdotal, but the call takers I, I've spoken to and as they talk about the issues they've had, did not raise money. It, 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 they didn't talk about salary. Uh, they talked about uh, uh, stress. They talked about hours. They talked about uh, morale, workplace environment. Um, they talked about uh, uh, feeling supported to a person. And again, not a massive scientific study on my part, but no one mentioned money, at least in my experience. Um, so one of the things, Bo, I want you to speak to and, and, and kind of demystify um, for the public and for those watching that uh, people think that they say, well, we've gone to the website and we don't see adver advertisements for the job. Y'all aren't trying to fill the positions. So would you explain how the, the academy system works and how we actually staff nine one, the 911 center and, and, and the TikTok of how that's done uh, for folk who, who say, I don't see the job listings posted? Sure. Uh, thank you, Council Member. I appreciate the opportunity to, to describe that. Um, so, and then I will close with noting uh, a, a change in that process that we've implemented fairly recently uh, to, to address that concern. Um, so traditionally, uh, the academies, uh, when we have traditionally held four academies a year, and those academies have, uh, have space for, for trainees uh, in that process. When it is time to start the next academy or several months before the next academy, uh, the positions have been posted on our website. We have usually received um, a, a very sufficient number of applications to fill those academies. Uh, between the time when we uh, post and receive applications and actually start the academies, there is a significant screening process that takes place. There is a, a skills-based uh, online uh, screening process. There is a psychological background that is conducted. Uh, there is a criminal background check uh, and all of the, and, and then of course interviews uh, with leadership in the department, uh, all, all to, to choose the right candidates to, to move into that uh, trainee class. Um, this is a position that I think is, is an excellent career opportunity uh, because it does not necessarily start with a lot of prerequisites. So it's a great opportunity for someone uh, who cho chooses a career path that doesn't necessarily take them to college, uh, but really wants uh, a position that has um, uh, upper mobility in our organization can really create a great long-term career. But because of that, there is still, uh, we get a, a large number of applications, but it is still takes a very special person to be a successful 911 operator. So getting through that initial screening process is, is a first uh, and not an insignificant barrier. Once they are through and an academy starts, that academy now lasts 12 weeks. That is a... Um, that is a time period that has fluctuated over the years. And we adjust the curriculum in the training academy and the length of the training academy based on the needs and the changing nature of 911. But it has been set at 12 weeks for a number of years. Uh, then coming out of those 12 weeks, you move into the final phase of training. And that is one-on-one -on -one mentorship on the floor of the 911 center where you are shadowing an experienced uh, call taker and telecommunicator. And then you are actually taking calls with that person uh, at your side. And it is only when you have successfully completed that process that you're released onto the floor as a, as a full-time call taker. That period of time uh, can fluctuate. Uh, some people move through it very quickly and very successfully. Uh, some people need an extra amount of mentorship. Uh, obviously, it is critical that we not release that person until they are fully prepared to do that job. So, so the whole process from start to finish can run five to six months. That can change depending on if someone misses some of the classroom time, they may need some extra classroom time. So, uh, so that is the, the very long process. Historically, uh, we then made sure that we were only opening up the application process as we were getting ready to prepare for an academy. Uh, but we did hear a lot of public sentiment like, hey, I, I'm interested in this job and I want to get my name on this. So we had some internal conversations in coordination with human resources over the last month when we heard those concerns uh, and decided that we would instead move to uh, a system whereby we do have an open registry. Now you uh, can apply at any time for this position. You're notified about what the next step in the process will look like in the time frame for that process. But so we do have an open recruitment on our website that will allow you to apply for this position. We have also made sure um, that we 
um, are uh, being more assertive about creating opportunities for people to come to us from other agencies. So we have a number of listings uh, that I think came out of these conversations uh, for people who may be accredited in the same way that we accredit and train our call takers from other uh, urban agencies uh, and that we have a, a better pipeline now and are continuing to work on that pipeline to get, to get people in who don't necessarily have to go through that five-month training process. So those are a couple of things I'd encourage anyone watching this meeting uh, to go to our website. If you're interested in a career, we have, uh, we have a number of positions posted now. Uh, and I think we're going to try and do a better job of making sure that those opportunities are clearly accessible to anyone who might, might want a career in, in emergency communication. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. I'm, I'm wondering uh, very briefly, it, I know that the, uh, the police department and fire department have had these ongoing campaigns and efforts to share information and have been proactive in going out into the community, churches, schools, high schools. Um, it, are we planning anything, any type of campaign to educate the public on these career opportunities and perhaps for high school or high schoolers or going out into the community? I know you're already stress in terms of people, but no, yeah. you know, is, is a way we can be helpful in maybe uh, being ha having a campaign similar to other departments in terms of education and recruitment? That, that's absolutely something we've talked about over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we don't have firm plans to announce on that yet, but I think we recognize that not only might there be that opportunity, uh, but there really might be some excellent opportunities to coordinate with some of those departments you mentioned uh, and, and, you know, and, and share multiple opportunities when we go out into the community around areas of public safety uh, and, and really, you know, get people excited about this career. So I, I appreciate that suggestion and it's definitely something we've been, we've been talking about. Well, I know, I know six highly influential and prominent people in this city that I know would be willing to help out that, help out with that and spread the word. And if you're watching, you know, we're hiring. So final question in terms of, 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 of posture, um, and readiness and, and responsiveness of the department. Um, anecdotally, somebody calls, we've heard case, somebody calls no answer, uh, voicemail, multiple calls, um, no response. Does that happen and how, what does that mean if and when that happens? I wanna be clear, there is no voicemail uh, in okay. the Durham 911 Center. There is no technological capability for anyone to leave a message. Uh, we want, please help us spread the message that anyone who has a report of something like that, we have the ability to research any call that comes into our 911 center. We've been doing it every single day. We've heard similar conversations uh, and concerns. Uh, we, are, we are anxious to get to the bottom of any of those. We, we have successfully understood what happened. Uh, it can be, when someone has talked about a message, uh, we haven't really successfully understood exactly what occurred there. But, um, it, it, well, for, for instance, in one case, we found someone who called from a cell phone uh, who told us that, that they dialed 911 and ended up getting a message. What, what we learned was that call, the, the cell tower redirected that 911 call, thought that 911 call was coming from a different jurisdiction. They ended up in a different jurisdiction's 911 center because their cell company sent them there. Those things do happen. We are constantly trying to understand that where things are within our control, we have the ability to understand our systems and adjust our systems. When they're out of our control, we have the chance to, to advocate to sell companies, report it to the state. So, so all information is good information when someone has that experience. Second, to, to, to your second comment about calls not getting answered, we have, your call will, will be answered by our 911 center. That call will stay in queue. Um, we, the, the, a high majority of calls are being answered by our call center in 20 seconds or less. Uh, and, and, and we are constantly, you know, looking at the numbers to ensure we have staffing at high volume times to make sure that wait times are as low as possible. But I want to say that circumstances exist and happen when calls have to wait because of the number or the nature of calls that have come into the 911 center in a particular period of time. When that happens, please stay on the line. Your call will be answered. A 911 operator will answer that call. So, um, our efforts will continue to be focused on staffing at levels to make sure that the wait times are as low as they can be, but there will be circumstances when there are longer wait times. And we ask people for their public safety, please stay on the line. We will answer the call and, and that call will stay in our queue until it's answered. No messages, no rerouting. Those calls will stay in Durham and we will answer them. 
Well, both, thank you so much. That that that's uh, good to hear and good to know. I know it's still a lot of work to be done. So please convey our, our thanks and support to uh, the staff and those folks that that work uh, uh, in the center. Um, you know, oftentimes when the darkness descends, the voices that we hear on those phones are the first indication that you're not alone, uh, and that help is on the way. So we, we appreciate uh, greatly what you do. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Any other questions or comments, colleagues? Um, Mr. Ferguson, thank you so much for being with us. I just want to say, you know, one of the uh, many, many years ago when I was managing my own small company uh, and, and learning about management, um, we used to talk about a manager, uh, the best managers were uh, like helicopters. You could stay up in the air and you would get the big perspective up there, but you could also quickly get down on the ground and into the details and the best managers could do both of those things well. And I just want to say, I really think that this is such a good example of uh, the way in which you have handled this, of that, uh, that type of management. You've got the big perspective, you've done a great job of explaining it, uh, but you've also been down in the details uh, with uh, Mr. Beeman and the members of his team. And I just want to appreciate you for that. I know uh, it's, been a, it's, it's, it's been hard, but uh, I think Council Member Reese uh, said it well already about our, our, our extreme admiration for you uh, and the job that you do. Um, I also want to say, colleagues, I think some of this is up to us now in terms of the messaging. We, we know the situation. You know, a, a, a reporter recently, uh, you know, heard from one person who had to wait 67 seconds. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I won't go into the whole thing, but, you know, th this reporters are going to find people who are complaining. We know the facts now. And when people call us, we need to give them the facts. And we need to be very, very clear uh, about what's going on in the 911 center. Uh, people, people can be assured that we, our 911 center is answering all the calls, that there is no voicemail, uh, that uh, a, a, uh, the, the vast, vast majority of the calls are being answered quickly. Uh, and we need to make sure that we get that message out. Part of that's on us. All right, uh, Mr. Ferguson, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thanks to Mr. Beeman and team. Thank you, Mayor. And, and I just wanna uh, appreciate uh, you and council members, your, your support and your expressions of appreciation to the staff are, have been palpable. Uh, and and uh, we appreciate the partnership as we continue to work to addressing some of the concerns that were discussed today. Thank you. All right, colleagues, um, we'll now move on to our next item and I'll introduce Mr. Allor to uh, give any introduction that he would like to give. Let me just remind everybody that um, these are, you know, we do have in our, on our uh, iPads for the special meeting, we do have the, um, the slides available uh, for the next presentation as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm going to yield to Claudia Hager for introductions. Ms. Hager, before you get going, I just want to welcome you. Uh, we're really glad to have you. We are uh, really pleased that you're in the position that you're in. We know that our County Commission colleagues have unanimous uh, faith in your abilities. And um, we just want you to know, and I've said this to you before, but I want to say it to you in this context, uh, anything that we can do to support you as a council or as individuals, don't hesitate to call on us. Um, and I also uh, know that our, uh, our city manager feels the same way. So uh, we're really glad you're here and we wanna be supportive of you in any way that we can. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mayor. And I have felt the outpouring of support from um, your, some of your council members, as well as of course, Manager Page and, and your staff. So I appreciate all of that support. And it's a pleasure to be with you this morning um, to share about a pilot program recommended by the Department of Services um, Board. Um, it was also approved by the Durham County Board of Commissioners to address uh, economic support for our long-term homeowners at or below 30% of the average median income. I know this is a priority of the council um, as well as commissioners as we try to have a portfolio of options to support our residents who may be in economic need. Um, Dwayne Brinson, our Durham County Tax Administrator, 
will facilitate the discussion along with Ben Rose, um, our Department of Social Services Director. Um, Janine Gordon, um, the Assistant Director for um, DSS will also um, share in the conversation. Um, I will turn over the discussion now to Dwayne. I like this first slide. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council. Uh, it's good to be here this morning. I appeared before the council last year when we came up with a new program, uh, another option to the grant program. So we're excited to bring this program to the council. We've presented it to the county commission as well. Um, this program is a grant-based program if you'll go into the next slide, I'll cover a brief outline of today's presentation. So very briefly, I'm gonna cover the existing state property tax relief programs. We've, we've discussed those in the past quite a bit. So any questions you might have, feel free to ask them, but it'll be a brief overview. I'm gonna cover the, the current deferral program that we came up with last year as an alternative to the grant-based program. And I have some stats on the deferral program as well. Then we'll talk about the Mecklenburg County Homes Program, which is the model that we are following here with our new program proposal. And then I'll go into the specifics of our homeowner grant program that we are proposing to the County Commission and the Council, as Manager Hager mentioned, to, uh, to help economically support our longtime low-income homeowners. And we feel like this program, it, it's exciting. We're excited to offer it to the community and we're excited to present it to the governing boards. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the brief overview of the existing programs, we have the homestead exemption, we have the circuit breaker deferment and the disabled veteran exclusion. Those are income driven programs. You have to make uh, less than 31.5 a year to qualify, but they also are age driven. You have to be at least 65 years of age or totally and permanently disabled to qualify for at least the first two, the homestead and the circuit breaker. The disabled veteran, there is no age requirement and it knocks off 45,000 from the tax assessment. So those are the existing programs, at least the most popular programs. We have about 1800 homestead exemption beneficiaries. We have this, the circuit breaker deferment being a deferral program. It's not as popular as the homestead exemption. I think we have about 27 beneficiaries of the circuit breaker deferment. But these are the big three programs that we have. And then on the next slide, you'll see, I, I discussed this a lot with the council and with the, with the commissioners last year. We wanted to simplify we wanted to provide a simple way to get word out about these programs. If you, if you come into our office, if you go into any county tax office, the application can be intimidating. It's a multi-page legal application. And we wanted a better way to help people ascertain whether or not they might qualify for a program. And it's also a good mechanism for our staff for when people call in and they may express trouble with their tax bill, we can run through this pre-qualifier and see if they qualify for any of these popular programs. And you can see it basically takes a multi-page application and it condenses it down to just a few uh, check boxes or multiple choice questions. And at the end, when you click on submit, it will run, it'll run a program in the background and it'll let the person know if he or she might qualify for any of these programs. So this has been a really nice addition to our website for the community. Um, and it's a good way for us to get the word out about the existing programs. Next slide, please. So last year we were working a lot with the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit on a grant-based program. And I'm, I'm not gonna go in depth on this. We discussed it a lot last year, but basically, it's for, for people that earned 30% or less of the area median income, the AMI, and they met and they had other opportunities here. You can see through all these or statements, there were other opportunities to get into this program that they would be awarded a grant by the participating jurisdiction, meaning Durham County, City of Durham, Fire District. Um, 
the, this, this program basically allowed the taxpayer to pay 1% of their household income and property taxes, and the remainder would be covered through a grant program. Next slide, please. As an alternative to the grant program, we came up with a deferment program. So instead of the participating jurisdiction awarding a, uh, a grant to the qualifying taxpayer, we had to come up with this alternative. And, and we mentioned last year, this program, this deferment program, we wanted it to be just the start. You know, this, this was just the start of the conversation, but we wanted to offer it as an alternative. And what it, what it does is take, takes the population 30% of AMI or lower, they can file a basically a perpetual payment agreement with Durham County Tax Administration. And through that payment agreement, we would allow them to pay only 4%, which ties back to the circuit breaker income level. We would allow them to pay only 4% of their annual household income towards their property taxes. The difference between the 4% they pay and the total tax bill would be deferred. Instead of a grant being paid, uh, it, this, this program deferred that balance with interest, with advertising fees, et cetera, so on. As, as uh, running in uh, correlation with this program, we made an effort to solicit private contributions to help those participating in this program with the cost of that deferral. The, and you can see down here the last bullet, that the equity in this program is that it does tie back to the circuit breaker. The circuit breaker requires 4% of income, and that's where we got the 4% of income for this program as well. Now, the particular stats of this program, it, uh, you know, in its first year, uh, I think, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't incredibly popular being a deferral program. We are, we have gotten more interest this year, and I think it would continue to grow. Um, but for 2020, the stats we had private contributions. So the, the, the Durham community, they contributed $3,678.81 in private contributions to help those in this program offset the cost of those deferred taxes. We had, we received seven applications for this program, seven applications. Of those seven, two of the applications were approved. And those two approved applications, they have a deferred balance of $1,796.72. So you can see that the amount of private contributions that were made for 2020 property taxes from, from the Durham community, they would pay off the deferred balance of the program participants. And that's what we wanted on a much larger scale. And I think we, it would grow over time. But that's the basics of the program we came up with last year. Next slide, please. So the proposed program is a tax subsidy program that would be administered. The application, uh, the eligibility would be managed as a welfare program, as a tax subsidy program through DSS, Department of Social Services. There will still be tremendous coordination with my office in Durham County Tax uh, in, in certifying values and in, in certifying tax bills and making sure that uh, program applicants for this program aren't receiving other benefits. So there's a tremendous amount of coordination still, but the application and eligibility determination would be through DSS. And this, is, this fits in line with the nature of DSS. So it fits very well within this department and that separation uh, between the tax office and DSS is a positive for this program. Next slide, please. So the model we're following, the Mecklenburg County passed this uh, program, it's called the Holmes Program in the fall of last year. So about eight, eight or nine months ago, they passed the Holmes Program. That's what we're modeling our proposed program after. And there is a link provided here and we can send that out as well, um, but it's, it's prominently displayed on the Mecklenburg County website as well. Next slide, please. 
it's just a map of uh, county tax rates in North Carolina. The darker the shade, the higher the county tax rate. Uh, next slide, please. The Mecklenburg County Homes Program, just uh, the general qualifications for what Mecklenburg County is doing, or at least did in 2020. The grant funds, and, and again, much like our proposal, it is a cooperation, collaboration between Mecklenburg County DSS and the Mecklenburg County Tax Collector's Office. So the grant funds for a qualifying applicant, they'd be paid directly to the Mecklenburg County Tax Collector to offset part of the property tax bill. Application and review, that's all managed through DSS. The amount granted for the Mecklenburg County program, the amount granted is equal to 25% of the tax amount due on the last available tax bill, not to exceed $340. So there's a cap on the Mecklenburg County uh, program of $340. The household income for this program must not exceed 80% of area median income. And for this program, they required a three-year residency to qualify. And uh, you know, likewise, there is no age restriction. It doesn't matter what age you are. If you meet the other qualifications in Mecklenburg County, you could apply for this program. So our program that we're proposing here in Durham, subject property has to be within Durham County, right? The income we are suggesting kind of follows the, the grant program we were looking at last year. It ties back to that 30% of AMI. So the income must be 30% of area that the household income must be 30% of AMI or lower to qualify for this. Residents can't be receiving any other state tax relief program, such as the ones I just showed earlier, the homestead exemption, the circuit breaker deferment, disabled veteran. We're trying to capture a population that can't get assistance now. The homeowners to qualify for this program, they should have owned their home as a primary residence for at least the last preceding 10 years to qualify for this. And again, going back to the grant program that we were looking at last year, so it's where we got a lot of these qualifiers from. The capped assistance, we've um, uh, increased that over what Mecklenburg County was doing. Our proposed capped assistance would be $750 of the total tax bill. So a little more benefit to this program here. Next slide, please. And just an example to show you what this looks like for you know different home values, different ranges. A home value, I'll take the middle one, a home value of $100,000. You see it's combined. When we say combined, city and county. Uh, the combined tax bill is $1,243.90. 50% of the tax bill would be $621.95. So the amount granted in this tax subsidy would be $621.95. Now you move on through that, that spectrum of values there and you get up to $150,000. You can see that the grant subsidy is a little lower than 50% because of that cap. The cap kicks in once you get to that higher value. Next slide, please. The budgetary impact we, we've got on here, the um, Durham County, $750,000, the city of Durham, $500,000 for a total uh, 2122 of 1.25 million to help fund this program. And we have an additional note here at the bottom that additional funding needs will be offset by ARPA funds or fund balance. Should that need arise? And we've got a you know, mid-year adjustment. We'll look in January 22. It's going to be a constant monitoring of this program to see how it's doing. Um, and, and that mid-year adjustment review will be January 2022. Next slide, please. So how are we going to market this? I think we have, we have a lot of uh, organizations here in Durham that will really help us get the word out about this program. So what we're looking to do, uh, obviously, an insert with the tax bills, that's a low cost option that hits every single property owner in Durham County. We'll do a, a, an attractive, a well-worded insert with the tax bills. Community-based targeted partnerships. 
social media, traditional media, community access points, um, public-private partnership with community organizations, just everything that we can to try to get the word out about this program. And one option I didn't list on here was um, an obvious inclusion of this program on our tax assistance evaluator that we have that I explained early in the presentation. So having that on there as well. Next slide, please. Okay, and with that, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions about this exciting program from uh, the council. Mr. Brinson, thank you. We really appreciate you being with us. Um, are Mr. Rose uh, or Ms. Gordon also going to present or are, they, are you all mainly here for questions, Mr. Rose? Mainly here for questions, Mr. Okay, Aaron. great, thank you. All right, um, first of all, I wanna thank you, Mr. Brinson for this um, and for, uh, I, 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 I'll start with a question or two. Uh, the evaluator tool is, I remember when you first presented it and is it widely used? Yeah, I have engaged the traffic on it in some time, but I, we, we have gotten many, many comments from the public uh, and from staff. And uh, I have seen that other counties have adopted this evaluator tool. And that's, that's what I love seeing is, is Durham leading the way and right. coming up with these initiatives. So it, it's, it's a widely popular tool. It's great. I think it's really, really a good tool. Uh, the, the deferment program um, that we that that uh, you all started last year. I assume with this program, that would no longer continue to operate. Is that true? I think we would phase that out uh, since this is a pilot program. It seems like we would phase that out beginning with the 22-23 fiscal year. But uh, quite obviously, if if someone can choose to um, qualify for a grant-based program, it seems more attractive than a deferral program. But it will be a a slow phase out. We want to make sure this program sticks and it's the best thing that, uh, is the best thing for the community before we phase out the alternative option. But okay. certainly if anybody applies for the deferral option, we'll say, hey, why don't you take a look at this program as well? Okay. With Char with Mecklenburg, I'm, I'm not familiar enough to with the county to know, but uh, does that mean that Charlotte and, and I assume there are other municipalities within Mecklenburg, uh, did they also participate? Now that I did not research, I, all, I saw, all I saw was uh, the program through the Mecklenburg County Tax Collector. Uh, you know, my assumption would be, would be that they do, but I, um, I don't have facts on that. Okay. Um, and the, uh, is the county commission, um, I, I know the county commission has deliberated on this. Uh, have they decided that this is the program that they're going forth with? Mm, yes, yeah. yes um, and I was responding to um, Councilman Reese's question in the chat. Yes, the board um, has uh, moved forward with this approach. Um, we plan to adopt our budget on the 14th. One of the things that um, anytime you have a pilot, you have a, a, an opportunity to tweak it and the way it works, the DSS board recommended this and, and the commissioners um, either have to adopt what the board does or it has to go back for deliberations through um, the DSS board. So from a procedural perspective. So uh, what we are uh, planning to do just with all DSS related programs is to gauge um, interest um, levels of um, um, interest as well from categories that are above the 30 percent uh, of although they're not uh, going to be ones that we can fund uh, and then mid-year determine if we have the capacity to go higher because th the challenge is knowing how many will apply um, and also in looking at levels that's another area that our board had concerns about it was an opportunity to go above the $750. And this level is consistent with the program um, that DSS offers for other types of home subsidies. And Ben can weigh in 
more I should have probably let him join in. <laughs> That's quite quite all right. So yes, yeah, so the um, the DSS board does meet next Wednesday. I, th I saw that was a, a question from uh, Councilperson Reese. The um, the DSS board is really in a what they're in what their position and role I believe would be in this is to basically just authorize the department to do the program. I think the governing bodies um, would, you know, would set policy uh, and, and, and parameters. Um, the DSS board would simply support and endorse um, us doing that. Now, of course, if they felt that there was a parameter or policy that was too extreme, they might push back a little bit or something. But for the most part, the DSS board is very supportive of this program and I think is open to, you know, as, as we say, it's a pilot and we do that intentionally to, to be open to changes, modifications, or whatever might be needed to make it more successful. Thank you, Mr. Rose. Uh, I like your vacation spot there. <laughs> I'm there in my mind. <laughs> I can see, I, I'm, I'm with you. Um, so, uh, is there a number that uh, I know? I've, and I, um, I know that I've heard this before, but I'm, I've lost this in my memory. Uh, the number of households in Durham of homeowners who are below 30% of AMI. Do we have that number? Uh, and especially those who would be eligible uh, having been in their homes for more than 10 years. I don't know that we would be able to know that, but um, do we have any, inst any, any, any information on that available? Madam, Madam Hager, you want me to answer that? Please. Okay. We, we expect a, a total population to qualify of approximately 3,200 households going off memory here. Uh, we can provide the exact number, but it's around, uh, I want to say 3,200 uh, potential households that could qualify for this. Thank you, Mr. Brinson. And that would be above and beyond those who have qualified for the, the other programs? That's right. That's right. Okay. All right. All right, colleagues, um, other questions for Mr. Brinson, Mr. Rose, Ms. Gordon, Mayor Pro Tem. Sorry, y'all, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so those 3,200 households, are is that, uh, like are those people who definitely own homes and have been in their homes for two years or longer, like how'd you, or 10 years or longer, how did y'all uh, come up with that number? That's the number that we came up with last year and working with some city staff and working with the coalition using, and that, that's part of the challenge with this program is that we're going into an unknown. You know, we would estimate about 3,200 households, uh, could be a little more, could be a little less. We just, we don't know exactly at this point, mm -hmm. but in working with city staff and working with the coalition last year, we ascertained about, uh, it, when we exclude the homestead beneficiaries of about 1,800 people, we came up with, you know, 3,000 to 3,200 that would seemingly meet the qualifications. Okay. Um, thanks, y'all. I want to thank you for um, moving forward with this. It's something that we've been talking about for a long time um, and something that I think is really needed uh, for the community. As you move forward and refine the pilot, I think uh, raising the AMI is going to be really important for us moving forward. Um, there aren't a lot of people at 30% of AMI who can afford to own a home. Um, and the home prices in Durham right now are just astronomical. I mean, and anybody who's at 30% of AMI or below is probably gonna have to be in their house for more than 10 years because they wouldn't have been able to afford to buy anything in the last 10 years. Um, the, the home values on the slide um, in your presentation starting at going from 50,000 to 150,000 um, is just not where we are at all. Um, I think the, you know, the least expensive house I've seen sold in my neighborhood was a land trust house that still sold for over 150,000, um, this year. So I think we, you know, just in, in terms of, I know it's a pilot and I'm excited to see the results. Um, but as we move forward, I think that we need to be, we need to be able to reach more people, um, and help more people with this program. And we need to think about like where Durham is now in terms of what homes are costing and what people's taxes look like. 
Um, and it's, and it's changing really quickly too. You know, our, our median home price, um, has risen more quickly over the last five years than the previous five years. And given the trends of folks moving here, I think we can, you know, and, and the new companies that are coming to Durham, I think that we can expect that to continue. So I, I want, I want our relief efforts to match the, the, the situation in the community um, and to be, you know, and to be scaled up to two levels that are really going to be able to impact a significant number of Durham residents um, and help people, help people be able to stay here. Um, especially as we, you know, as we continue to grow. Um, I'm, I'm really concerned and I know we're all really concerned about continued displacement and property taxes aren't a primary cause of displacement. Um, repairs and maintenance are, are what we see as the, as the primary cause, um, but property tax relief can be really important for folks. Um, and so I'm really glad that we're, that we're moving forward with this and, and hope, to, hope to see it grow and scale up in the future. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. I was just looking at the the uh, the AMI chart in 2020 uh, for for a family of two. The 30 percent of AMI was about twenty two thousand uh, dollars. So that just I think puts a fine point on what uh, you were saying. All right, colleagues. Other questions and comments for uh, Mr. Brinson or Mr. Rose or Ms. Gordon, uh, Councilmember Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to thank uh, the folks who came from the county to present this program. Um, Mr. Brinson, I appreciate your personal leadership in providing and working with DSS and also Mr. Rose and working together to put and working to put this pilot together based on some existing programs in other jurisdictions. Um, I wanted to take just a moment to uh, underline for folks who may be watching how extractive uh, and regressive our current property tax system is. Uh, this is a system that extracts um, way too much money from low wealth communities of color in Durham and across North Carolina. Um, we could, uh, as, a, as a city come together, as a community, as a city and a county come together and craft a much fairer uh, property tax system um, in which the folks uh, who can better afford to shoulder a higher tax burden uh, could take more responsibility for putting uh, money into our into meeting our public needs. Unfortunately, um, state law and in part of the state constitution prevent uh, local communities like Durham from doing that. And so we are forced to uh, find what uh, our uh, illustrious mayor has called Durham workarounds. Um, the city began the process of trying to do that with our um, with our long-time low-income homeowner grant program uh, in three communities in the city where uh, the city has previously made significant investments in affordable housing. Uh, last year, uh, the county proposed and the city approved uh, with my vote, but with my strenuous objections, um, the, the, um, the deferral program uh, that Mr. Brinson, you mentioned earlier, um, I agreed to vote for that, uh, even though it was awful uh, because it was at least marginally less extractive uh, from low wealth black and brown communities uh, here in Durham uh, than the current system. Um, but I think uh, the, the, the deep concerns and ambivalence about the program I had are belied by the statistics about folks who have applied for or accepted the program. I'm really glad uh, that, um, that we have moved on uh, or will be moving on to a better program. This, the particular proposal that, uh, that the County Commission will consider as part of their budget uh, in this upcoming cycle is a vastly improved uh, project uh, to uh, more fairly align the property tax burden here in Durham um, and alleviate that burden for folks who can least afford to shoulder it. Um, and I wanna thank uh, Mr. Brinson, Mr. Rose, um, uh, County Manager Hager and our, and our colleagues on the County Commission for moving this program forward uh, for approval as part of the county budget. I fully support uh, the city's funding of the portion that's estimated uh, for city taxes that will be required to implement the grant program. I uh, also want to, uh, to associate myself with the remarks of the mayor pro tem about uh, the fact that as currently conceived, um, the pro this program will help precious few folks in our city. Uh, the folks that it does help will really need the help, uh, and that's why I support it. Um, but I think 
um, many more people in our community need uh, access to this program that are not able to get it under the current guidelines. Uh, and so I wanna encourage our partners at the county to strongly consider increasing the income eligibility level to 60% of area median income and to increase the cap on the particular, on the individual grants to something more in the neighborhood of $1,000. Obviously that makes the program more quote unquote expensive uh, from the perspective of uh, the two local governments who will be administering it. Um, but I think that more fairly meets the needs that our community faces uh, when they, when we try to grapple with what is fundamentally an unfair and regressive underlying property tax system. Um, so I know that our colleagues in the County Commission have not approved the budget yet, um, that there is still a chance that they will change, that they will make some additional changes, but more mostly, Regardless of that, I look forward to the opportunity to engage uh, with our county partners over the next six months to figure out how it's working, um, what changes can make the program more effective, um, and to hope that we can continue to have these kind of robust conversations. Um, mostly, what I feel today is gratitude, a sense of hope, and a sense that this can be a much better program if some small tweaks are made to it. And I hope that in partnership with the county, the city can, uh, can advocate for that um, uh, between now and June 14th when the county approves its budget, but also over the next six months as we, as this pilot begins to operate um, in the city and county and we learn more about where the real needs are uh, as a community. The last thing I wanna say is that it would be irresponsible not to uh, lift up some of the longtime advocates for a countywide program uh, who are see now seeing their vision uh, put into, uh, set into uh, public policy at both the city and county level, specifically Dr. Jim Savara, who, as far as I know, was the first person to come forward with this kind of proposal here in Durham, uh, was certainly the architect of what we have tried to do at the city, um, and whose proposal, from whose proposal, many of the many of these particular uh, conditions are drawn. We'll just say Dr. Savara also supports increasing the income eligibility to 60% of A in mind, raise, raising the grant uh, cap to $1,000. Um, and also uh, Larissa Seibel, who's been uh, a stalwart advocate uh, for additional grant support for low-income uh, communities uh, because she understands better than I think most folks, uh, at least as, as, as far as I know, the, the really regressive way that the property tax system works in communities like Durham. Um, that's probably more than folks needed to hear from me, but uh, really uh, grateful to the county and hope we can continue to improve this program going forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, council member. I realized that I had forgotten one question I had, Mr. Brinson. Uh, on the slide about um, the cost, the $2.2 million it's referred to, can you talk about that a little bit? Manager Hager, did you sure, wanna- Sure, I'll, I'll weigh in on that. Um, that we took an incremental approach in how we funded um, the program in that um, if, if of the 3,200 applicants applied and they were eligible for the $750, it would be closer to $2.2 million. Um, what we did was um, put an amount in the budget of $750,000 for the county and a placeholder of 500,000 um, for the city. So we can see what those patterns were. Um, and that's the, the, the gray area of all of this. Uh, but we have a backup plan. It's one thing to have a strategy and you don't have the full funding there um, and not have a backup plan, but we do. So um, in talking with um, city um, staff and leadership, that strategy was to um, appropriate either um, ARPA dollars um, through the American Rescue Plan Act um, because this would be an appropriate economic support um, program. Uh, and so uh, that would be a route or we could use um, our uh, fund reserves through our fund balances to cover it. So this just uh, helped us to do that delicate balancing act with the budget looking at the patterns at um, Mecklenburg County, you know, they budgeted $250,000. Uh, they had, I think maybe 170 
um, residents who, who did apply. And so they had only used about 170,000 of those dollars um, about a month ago. So we, we were trying to um, figure out an approach to move forward because it was in a pilot phase, but have a strategy as we work through the year to add additional dollars, which also um, sort of speaks to the issue of um, our ability to you know, raise the level later in the year if, if we determine in the initial phase of the pilot, um, that is, is an option. Um, the, uh, yeah, so, so uh, that sort of um, gives the rationale behind it. Thank you very much, Manager Hager, I appreciate it. Um, Council Member Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Manager Hager, for the presentation, and Mr. Brinson, and thank you, Ms. Gordon and Mr. Rose for being here. I, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I, I just wanted to ask a few questions. Uh, is this limited to 2020 taxes? The program as proposed would be for fiscal year 21-22, so it'd be for 2021 taxes. Okay, I was just making sure. And then just noting there were a few um, eligibility re requirements in the Mecklenburg uh, program that I hope didn't transfer over. And I'm just noting the few that you listed, there aren't any other eligibility requirements. No, I think what we listed on the slide would be our main qualifications. And I'll ask DSS to weigh in as well if there if there are any other qualifications that they would look for in this program. So, uh, I, I mean, basically the qualifications would be given to us and we would enforce those qualifications and then we would do the process to verify those qualifications. So if it's 30% AMI, we would have to go through the income verification. Obviously we'd be working with tax and Dwayne's folks in terms of the verification of tax data and so forth. So we would enforce what the guidelines are given to us, we would have to develop the process in which we verify that information and then and then get payment out. Thank you. I, and, I, and I just wanted to make sure before I, I noted a few things, I will, I will note that I appreciated Councilmember Reese noting that Jim Savara, Dr. Jim Savara brought this forward. I appreciated the opportunity to work with him um, as the chair of the Northeast Central Durham Leadership Council um, prior to being on, on this on the council, on the city council. I, I just wanted to say that along the same lines as we were talking about earlier um, and supporting our staff, I think this is important to make sure that we're supporting uh, some of our most vulnerable residents in our community. Um, just, just noting that gentrification has been pushing a lot of folks out of their homes. And so as much as possible, uh, I think the 80% AMI and the $1,000 um, cap is more amenable, but I would like to know what it would look like to even cover up to $1,400. And I don't know what those numbers look like, so I'm not suggesting it, but I would like to have an idea of whether it, it's, you know, astronomical or not. And so if you could share that, that would be really, really helpful. Uh, I don't want to advocate for more when it's not possible, but, um, and I, I do want to say there was was one other thing. I wanted to note that is, as long as we're setting this program up, acknowledging that folks are having difficulty with their taxes, it might be good to partner with someone in the community around, um, uh, around just supports that are in place, you know, make, making sure that if there are other opportunities or other resources that can be aligned with it. Um, I'm not sure that DSS does that on the housing side? And uh, I just want to make sure that that's all in, in play. And, and we would agree. We actually have talked about um, once the, the program rules get finalized, how we can partner with certain community agencies for, for access and support um, as well. So yes, that is definitely, I think the, the ERAP model can kind of become a model for other programs like this where we are it's not just about being in DSS. It can be housed throughout the uh, throughout the county. Um, reinvestment Partners is one, obviously, that comes to mind because 
uh, Larissa was mentioned earlier, we um, definitely have partners out there I think we could connect with for access points and, and processing and outreach. And I think uh, just noting along those same lines, the, the same ERAP conversation around the software, making sure that it's something that folks can all you know, have access to the follow along with their families that they're working with, whether it's through a doctor's office or, you know, um, like any agency that's involved with a family. And I will note that this, this is a really um, phenomenal opportunity right now to show what's possible and acknowledging just what Councilmember Reese um, mentioned around how regressive our tax system is and noting that there are folks on fixed income is not limited to people of color. Um, this, is, this is people with disabilities, this is people with family members who have disabilities. This is, this is everyone in our community who has experienced the hardship of COVID in addition to the hardship of being low income. And so I wanna make sure that we're not missing um, all the populations of people across the city and the county who could benefit from this. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good afternoon, everyone. Manager Hager, I, I, this, this is my first opportunity to, I think, greet you uh, formally in your new role in a public setting. So I want to say congratulations to you on your assumption of leadership and to celebrate what your being in that position means to so many uh, little Black girls and boys in our city uh, watching what's possible. So congratulations to you and welcome. Uh, to the rest of the team, welcome. Good to see you all, and thank you for the work you do. I want to associate myself with all of the comments uh, my colleagues have made. I, I too uh, celebrate um, the shepherding that, that Jim and Larissa have done in this project. But I also wanna acknowledge um, the black uh, women and men activists that I met over 20 years ago working on this uh, in East Durham and Northeast Central Durham along the Fayetteville Street Coordinator, uh, along the Fayetteville Street Corridor that had been sounding the alarm about this issue an inexorable march of gentrification in our city uh, for decades. Um, first off, I, I'm, I'm excited about this. There's, there's rarely a pilot I'm going to meet that I don't like. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for pilots. Um, so, and I also want to associate myself with, with the, the, the need and the, the admonition of getting our AMI levels that we serve higher because this, for many of us in the community, this isn't just about keeping some people in their homes. This is about the, the very fabric of the neighborhood. And, and we are watching uh, gentrification, you know, just relentlessly march forward. And I'm not saying this is too little too late because this is important for the folk that they do help, but, but uh, we know the assault that black wealth has taken. It doesn't always have to be as dramatic as a Tulsa uh, running folk out their neighborhood. Sometimes it's a drip drip of increasing taxes without being able to participate uh, in a thriving economy as well. So you've got this kind of conflation of a number of things. So with the people we help in this particular program, I just wanna just, just echo some of the, the, the anxiety that folk have in the community that this is, is a lot slower than the actual level uh, of loss we're seeing in our neighborhoods. Um, and I just wanna echo that as we work on these these tax programs, I wanna challenge my friends at the county and, and again, my colleagues here at the city, that we need to think about Marshall Plan type investments uh, in our neighborhoods and, and, and in our uh, legacy black neighborhoods and, and seriously muscularizing our shared economic prosperity plan as well. So we'll have folk who can afford to fix their house, who don't have to sell their house because uh, taxes and because they can't fix a leaky roof. We're not gonna be able to save our neighborhoods just do programs like these alone. Uh, we know that, but they're important. They're really important. And in our you know, statutory environment, there aren't many levers we can pull or buttons we can push as a government. But I'm proud that we as a government are pushing the ones we can and pulling the levers that we can. So uh, full throttle uh, on this pilot and the program and, and, and doing all we can. But I also think we need to be prepared to talk about what a radical rethinking uh, of, of, of budgetary priorities and, and, and a radical infusion, uh, uh, again, a la Marshall Plan type of portions into some of our legacy communities uh, here uh, in the city, uh, if we're seriously going to do battle uh, against the winds of gentrification that are blowing. Uh, but thank you so much, excited about the work, fully support 
Uh, good to see all of you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, council member. Other comments, colleagues or questions uh, for Mr. Brenson of the team? Council member Caballero. Thank you, and thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I really appreciate all the comments my colleagues have said. I look forward to a more aggressive uh, program in the future. I think there's consensus that um, we we don't believe that this is enough. While we appreciate uh, the the move, you know, movement in the right direction, um, and just wanted to share that. Thank you, Council Member. Colleagues, are there any other questions or comments? Um, I do have a couple. Uh, first of all, I want to agree with uh, my colleagues that I feel strongly that the council would support a higher threshold, a higher AM, AM, AMI threshold. Um, so I hope that as our county commission colleagues are considering this, um, that you all will convey to them. Uh, our, uh, uh, our emphasis on that here in this meeting. Uh, I think we're very, I know that we as a, co a council are very interested in, in this program and supporting it and making it, help it support as many people in our community as we can. Um, I think, so I, I hope you'll convey that. Um, the second thing is I want to say that uh, I think this is a really big step. We've been trying to figure out a way to make this happen for a while. And Mr. Brinson had applied his creativity to it last year. Uh, but I think what we have here now is really much, much better. Uh, and I think that I appreciate the creativity that the county has applied to it now. We've, we've needed to wait for you all since you all are the, the tax collectors. Um, and uh, we have been... Uh, uh, we're excited now that this program has come forward. I will say that I do think that part of the success of the program is going to rely on outreach and organizing and that I am very hopeful that our community development staff, our neighborhood improvement staff, uh, our, our, uh, the folks that we have, we have folks in, in, in budget who work on participatory budgeting or out there in the community with so many people out in the community, as do you all. Uh, in the county. I think that, that uh, organizing and outreach is going to largely determine the success of this program uh, at this AMI level. And um, I am really hopeful that we in the city can strategize, uh, that our staff will help us strategize about how to do that outreach, to find the people who are at the 30% AMI level uh, and to get them into this program. Uh, we know that a lot of them are not gonna be able to re be, be reached by uh, digital means, uh, we're gonna have to have really uh, strong outreach on that. And, um, but it, it's, a, it's an opportunity. I think this is a tremendous opportunity. I think we can uh, help. You know, if we could, if, if of those 3,200, uh, a thousand homeowners were able to take advantage of this, that would be great. If 2,000 were able to be able to take advantage of this, of our lowest income homeowners, that would be a tremendous win. And so, uh, I'll pledge myself to, to that uh, outreach, and I know that my colleagues will as well, but it needs to be on the ground, and I hope that we'll all be thinking about that together. Uh, other comments, colleagues, or questions uh, for the team from the county? Uh, Councilmember Freeman? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. To that point that you just made, I think it's also important to make sure that you align funds uh, to that conversation so that those folks who are um, getting out there on the ground, whether it's a community health worker or an agency or organization, um, that cost is also um, important to note for this important work. All right. Um, anything else? Manager Hager, thank you. Uh, we appreciate you and please pass on to our county commission uh, friends our appreciation for this program and our hope that we can uh, deepen the uh, that, that we can that, that we can increase the AMI uh, and, and uh, hopefully the subsidy level 
and that please let them know we would be supportive of that and that we are great, we're grateful to them for bringing this to us and to you all. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. And One final question, Ms. Hager. Um, how do you feel about the fact that, that, that your two top social services people always seem to be at the beach? You know, I want to be like them when I grow up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right well well no, uh, only in the mind I'm there pardon me what'd you say ben only in my mind I'm there. only in your mind the real I backdrop see. is ugly that's why, that's why my I know. virtual one's up I know. I know. But, but i will say mayor that um it's reflective of their attitude they always see a positive outlook <laughs> and um i will also share you don't have the benefit of knowing Ben Rose and Miss Janine, throughout our uh, fiscal year, often they come back and say, county commissioners, we need to expand how we're helping our residents. Um, we need to meet the needs differently. And so um, I, I feel good that, you know, whether we, where adjustments happen now or later, as we see the patterns, we will be responsive because that's the style and approach that, um, Ben Rose and his team already always does. So I, I, I feel good that we can incrementally get to a different place as we see, see those patterns, but I will convey to our board, um, the council's concerns and support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Manager. And I agree with your assessment of uh, your social services folks. We've had that experience with them as well. So thank you. All right, thank you very much to our county friends and uh, colleagues, it's now 11.06. Um, I just want you all to know that at 11.40 or 45, I'm going to leave this meeting temporarily to go meet my new granddaughter. Uh, and Mayor Pro Tem will be um, presiding at that point. I will be back at one o'clock, uh, however. And so we'll, we'll, we'll press on. Um, I do feel, do you all, would you all like a, a small break, a five minute break be good? I see some nodded heads. Uh, we'll be back at 1111. And I would just uh, ask you, remind you to please meet your microphones.
Mr. Mayor, you're muted. No wonder Mr. Allure wasn't answering my question. Thank you, Council Member. <laughs> I was wondering where he was. I'm sure he was wondering where I was. Uh, golly, sorry. We have three more topics today, but I wanted to know uh, before we get going, Mr. Allure, do you have any comments and are you satisfied with what we've done so far? Very satisfied. And just to, to lead off with the other business, there are no presentations here. Staff is simply available to, to answer any questions or offer any insight that you may uh, need. Thank you. All right, colleagues. Um, the first of our topics is the city long-time uh, homeowner tax grant. And um, uh, the council wanted this on the uh, agenda because we have heard from other neighborhoods who have a, a strong interest of being included in the long-term long -term homeowner uh, tax grants. And um, I will uh, defer to any of my colleagues who would like to uh, start this discussion off uh, with any comments or questions. Councilmember Freeman and Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just wanted to know, I was asking earlier about whether or not uh, the county's program would go back to 2020, specifically for this reason, acknowledging that um, there are many cities, uh, legacy neighborhoods that won't be included in that um, tax program. And so just noting that this is an opportunity to just kind of wedge the gap, so to speak, in expanding our current grant program, I would love to include um, those neighborhoods that have risen up like Walltown and uh, Bragtown and uh, Southside and Northeast Central Durham, I think are already in it. And I think that it's important to note that there are extreme pressures on the areas in our city that have experienced the most gentrification because of the lack of infrastructure being put into or lack of dollars being spent in the neighborhood to keep the infrastructure in place that they feel like they're being missed. And so I know we heard from Ms. Vanessa and Ms. Constance frequently over this last few months in the budget cycle as they participated in so many of our, you know, engagement projects and learned about all the things that their neighborhood was missing decades. And so just noting, I'm noting I'm having some internet trouble. Can you still hear me? We can, we, we can hear well, you. I, I just wanted to just make sure that we, we, we acknowledge that there's a, there's a subsection of, of folks in neighborhoods that have not experienced the same type of supports as trees, you know, being lining their, their streets or um, sidewalks or bus stops. And I think as a gesture at acknowledging, you know, just that in, in many of those areas, uh, we, can, we can just expand our grant this year and make sure that they, they, uh, they, they feel that we hear it, we're hearing them. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so we've talked several times about making this program citywide. Um, and if I recall correctly, the reason that we weren't gonna do that was because we felt like it was better to get the county in on a citywide um, program. And given the, so, so now we, we have that, right? The county has proposed a citywide program, but I think we all agree that it's not adequate um, to meet the need in the community. I'm hoping we can revisit the conversation about making this program citywide. And I know that there was also some concerns around legal justification from our attorney's office around um, making sure we could define the program as uh, that it had a, a clear public purpose. Um, but I think that given that gentrification is spreading to all areas of the Durham community, that it's not just the neighborhoods around downtown where there have been significant city investments, that we could make a strong legal argument for there being a public purpose to assisting low-income homeowners in all areas of the city. Um, I know the program is already underway, applications are underway uh, for this year, but I would support um, expanding the program regardless of geography uh, under the current 
income and um, ownership eligibility that we have. And that would cover um, that would cover Walltown, who specifically requested it as along with the other neighborhoods that Councilmember Freeman referenced, and any other you know person who doesn't have an organized neighborhood organization um, to to come forward um, yet. I know there's lots of people in Durham who could use this support um, who don't have the kind of you know great organization that we're seeing from from some of our communities. So I just want to make sure we're I want to make sure everyone has the opportunity. Um, and I think that we should reconsider the citywide program. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Um, maybe this is a good time to uh, bring in our staff uh, to remind us about the parameters of the current program and um, what the uh, eligibility what the eligibility is and uh, the uptake on the program. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, I believe uh, Mr. Johnson is uh, prepared. Um, we've had conversations internal uh, to bring this historical context uh, to, the, to the topic. So Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Madam Manager. Thank you. Welcome Mr. Johnson. Thank you, uh, Madam Manager. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Reginald Johnson, Director of the Department of Community Development for the City of Durham. Uh, one of the things that I'll do is just refresh our posture in terms of uh, the council approval for the program. If you will recall, the City Council approved a three-year pilot uh, for the long-time homeowner grant program. Uh, the three years ended last year. Uh, but you also remember that this, the department presented an interim report and the council asked the department to continue for one additional year. That's this year. Uh, so that's the, the posture of the uh, program uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the approval of governance. Uh, in terms of the eligibility, our program does go up to 80% uh, AMI. Uh, yeah, one has to have lived in their property since July 1, 2020, uh, and have experienced the increase in property tax obligations based upon 2016 property tax assessment and your 2019 property tax, tax assessments. Uh, we only include the properties that are located in Southside, Northeast Central Durham, the Southwest Central Durham target areas, and the properties in Northeast Central uh, Durham and Southwest Central Durham target areas must be located within proximity to a city of Durham housing investment that occurred between 2010 and 2015. Uh, if you, just to remind you, uh, we have, uh, I think in, in last year, it was, uh, we ended up with about 40, 40 applications. Uh, the year before that, I don't have my report in front of me. Well, actually, I do. The year before that, it was uh, 24 approved applications, I'm, I'm sorry. And uh, the year before that, it was 2018. And the, when I said 24, that was the interim report that we provided to the council. I'm sorry, what did you say for the year before that? I apologize. Yeah, 20, uh, the year before, th 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 I'm sorry, was uh, 24. When we presented the interim report to the city council, it was uh, in, in no 2019, it was uh, 24 uh, approved applications at the time. And uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson. And can you, uh, the, was there a certain period of time that you had to have lived in your house? I can't remember. Yes, you had to have, uh, lived in your property since July 1, 2012. 2012, okay. All right, I think you said that and I missed it, thank you. So that would have been, if we used the same parameters, you would have to have been in there for nine years. Yes, sir. Yeah, roughly. And the, um, okay. Uh, The there uh, there is also a 
the city attorney's office uh, weighed in pretty heavily about this when we set this up originally. And uh, I wonder if it would be useful at this time to refresh us on why the why this program was structured as it was. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I agree with you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and I will defer to our city attorney's office because that was a key aspect of the program that we do have. Uh, and uh, uh, Ms. Kukuro can uh, respond to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Kukuro. Thank you. Good after, or good morning, I guess, still. Um, Krista Kukuro, city attorney's office. Um, I'll just, as, as you requested, sort of remind the council um, of the origins of the program and its legal underpinnings um, at the time of its creation. So when it, when it was created, the primary legal underpinning uh, was the correlation, if not causation, of, between the city's investments in affordable housing in or nearby these neighborhoods and the increased property tax values. Um, I think at that time, there was a lot more speculation about sort of the constitutionality of this program. And so that was the way in which our office was able to support the defensibility of the program. Um, so that's what we have at the moment is um, this, this uh, parameter essentially that requires that there would have been city investment in a neighborhood um, or nearby to a neighborhood, it's a 500 foot uh, distance requirement. Um, to support in um, the program for these neighborhoods that it currently supports. Thank you, Ms. Kukuro. You said that uh, at the time there was more constitutional concern, or does that mean that there's less constitutional concern about now, or is the what is the stance of the department now? Do you have any other thoughts to offer us? Sure. Um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem sort of touched on this, the question of public purpose. Um, you know, I think based on research that our office has done, um, input from the School of Government, I do think that this program fits within uh, authority that um, the city and the county has, generally speaking, um, for supporting quote unquote welfare programs, um, as that term is used in our state laws. Um, and within the authority of kind of com community development programs overall. So um, there is authority to do this type of program. Um, you know, I think that there are some questions obviously about sort of adding other neighborhoods um, and our office does have some concerns there. I can talk about those now, or um, if you wanna sort of continue to ask different questions. Why don't you talk about those now? That'd be great. Sure. So given the parameters of the existing program as it's set up with this, um, with this parameter of city investment in or nearby the neighbor, to the neighborhoods, um, adding additional neighborhoods that have not had that level of investment would be an arbitrary decision. Um, and I think it would be um, hard to defend, which is not to say that the requests are, um, don't have merit. Um, I think if, this, if the desire is to add additional neighborhoods, I think that the program would need to be reevaluated and retooled significantly in order to accommodate those requests. Um, and our office would recommend additional changes in the sort of processing and administration of the program, specifically where the payment is made to, for example. Thank you. Um, suppose the program was citywide, was that with those, uh, with the, suppose the public purpose uh, led us to determine this should be citywide. I assume then that we wouldn't be adding particular neighborhoods. Um, we would be making a substantial change. Um, I assume that wouldn't create the same problems. It wouldn't create the same sort of arbitrariness problem that you're talking about. Mr. Mayor, you're muted. Now I can hear. Uh-oh. How about now, guys? Can you hear me? I could hear you before, too. Okay. I think Pierce might have a... Okay. Councilmember Preline, can you hear me now? 
not probably. Um, okay, I think he'll figure it out. Ms. Kukuro, uh, what are your thoughts? Um, I think a citywide program would be permissible under the statutory authority that the city has. Um, again, I think that it would need to be sort of evaluated to figure out if the current parameters and um, are what the, the city chooses to do. Of course, that's a policy decision for the city council. Um, again, our office would recommend some specific changes such as where the payment is made to right now. The payment is made to the homeowner. Um, we believe it is a much more defensible process for that payment to be made to the tax office. Um, so there would need to be input um, and kind of feedback, I think internally in the city to sort of figure out exactly how that um, program would be administered. But from a legal standpoint, there would be, there is authority for a citywide, citywide program. Thank you, that's very helpful. One more question for Mr. Johnson. Um, Mr. Johnson, remind me now of the, uh, the uh, do, are we covering both the city and the county portion of the taxes now for the? Uh... Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor, we are covering the city and the county portion. Okay. And what has been the approximate uh, cost of this program to us? So what I will do is to share the, uh, we've budgeted about 10000 uh, dollars. I think the last report that we made for the council at the time, we had shared about that it was uh, about seven thousand mm -hmm. dollars in actual disbursements, and uh, in terms of cost, there was a, a significant administrative cost. If you remember the uh, report that we provided, right? Thank you, Councilmember Caballero. Yeah, just to follow up, um, Mr. Johnson, would the administrative costs go down if we were not it just listening to what um, Krista Kukuro just shared with us around the payment piece of it, is that is that a part of it? Is that we're carrying that burden of distributing money to residents? And would so, that burden shift if it, if we change the, the payment mechanism? So the, the way I understand your question, you're asking if the administrative costs will go down if we change where the payment is made to, I suggest that it would not. Okay. Uh, one of the things in the report that we had mentioned when we talked, presented to the council before, is that uh, we expanded the program, it's going to have significant uh, more administrative costs, but that's not the, the way the payment goes to is a small part of that. Thank you, council member. Other comments or questions at this time, colleagues? Councilmember Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate the, uh, the additional questions and comments. I just wanted to just note how the context of the conversation is shifting. Um, it's a great idea to move to citywide. I just want to be clear that the, the impetus of, ex of especially noting the specific neighborhoods comes from a, a kind of equitable acknowledgement of how the history of the city has played out for folks in the neighborhoods that are of color, specifically black. And so I'm supportive of either option. I just wanna note that the, the kind of equitable push that I'm sitting on is in making sure that there's specific um, relief for folks who have experienced um, the harms uh, that have been noted and our uh, racial equity task force recommendations and many other racial equity conversations. And so, I'm, like I said before, the defensibility conversation is, is understandable. I'm supportive of moving it to citywide, but just noting that that's not equitable. And uh, I just wanted to just make that clear distinction. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Other comments at this time or questions, colleagues? Well, um, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll talk about some of my, uh, the thoughts that are going through my head and these are just that. Um, you know, I think about uh, the, the uh, what Ms. Kukuro said, and I think that she's considering this in, in a legal sense, the arbitrariness of adding certain neighborhoods. I think that that, 
implies to our city attorney staff, you know, that it's hard to defend it. Uh, you know, should someone say, and I think it's quite possible in this circumstance, someone would say, you know, uh, I don't want to be paying more taxes because someone else is paying less. Uh, our city attorney's office had what they thought was a defensible program. Now I'm hearing that there's a citywide program. What I'm hearing from the city attorney's office is they believe a citywide program is defensible. They don't feel like adding neighborhoods without some pretty clear criteria are def is defensible. Um, and so that's one thing on my mind. Another is that I do worry about the about adding particular neighborhoods and not adding others. You know, for example, um, you know, adding Walltown, uh, but not adding Crest Street. Uh, you know, because Crest Street's not as organized and hasn't come to us recently, is problematic to me. And I know that we can all think of other neighborhoods in town who uh, are uh, similarly situated. And so uh, I'm, I'm really thinking out loud here about some of the things that have been going through my mind and are now especially going through my mind uh, as we discuss this. Uh, I agree that I think it's really important to try to expand these uh, low-income homeowner tax programs. And I think that uh, we, we had a good discussion of, you know, one good avenue that I think will bear fruit uh, with the county, uh, especially in future years as it's expanded. Um, so, uh, you know, I love the idea of going citywide with this. It does seem like it's uh, a big lift. And this is June the 10th. Um, uh, you know, to have both the uh, administrative structure, figuring out what it would cost us, knowing all those kinds of things by budget time seems uh, very unlikely. So um, I'm, I'm struggling a bit with it, uh, looking for guidance from my colleagues, and I uh, appreciate any other thoughts that you all have to offer, or uh, yeah, so any other thoughts that you all, and I see the manager as well, Madam Manager. Um. Mr. Mayor, I would just like to add a few comments at this time. Please do. Um, we were <clears throat> certainly connecting uh, two discussions today uh, related to a citywide program and a very limited program. Uh, one of the, or some of the attractiveness, in my opinion, as, as manager of the program that we saw earlier citywide is that we are relying on administrative structure <clears throat> by an agency that is set up to do intake and uh, verification of uh, information to qualify individuals for a program. And what you all saw is that um, those um, parties that are, you know, that are offering that pilot are starting with, you know, 30% um, with, you know, with an estimate of about 3,000 potentially applicants that could come in at that level. Um, for that program, uh, I just wanted to highlight here that, you know, an 80% citywide program um, could have a significant uh, increase in, <clears throat> in applications. Uh, as you have mentioned, uh, without us having had an opportunity to determine potentially how many people that might be and what type of administrative structure uh, it would take, realizing that doing it at the city is going to be much less efficient than having an organization that is accustomed to doing uh, that type of intake and, and application review, um, even if the city paid for it um, or paid those administrative costs, it would definitely likely be more efficient if another agency handled it. Uh, in our internal discussions, uh, Mr. Johnson spoke about the uh, the application of his resources just to the 40 applications that they have to process uh, internally is, is pretty significant. So uh, I certainly support uh, tax grants. I am extremely excited to be able to work with the, uh, work with the county and the community uh, to, to make some better decisions uh, about where we invest our funding to help residents uh, but I did want to enter that uh, thought into your discussions at this time. 
Thank you, Madam Manager, for that uh, those comments and that uh, reality does. Colleagues, uh, Councilmember Caballero. Yeah, I just really wanted to appreciate Manager Page's comments. Um, I'm where you are, Mayor Shul. I'm I'm very torn. Uh, one of the other things that I'm hesitant is we are covering people's portion to the county, and if we expand that to citywide, I, I just see that I'm assuming it's the same parameters that we currently have that hasn't been determined. Um, and I guess it just kind of goes back to we have. I really want to lean in on my county commissioner colleagues because we have a program, you know, the, the criteria that the city has for its program, I think just needs to be carried over to the county program. And I think that if we really want to see, um, I think setting those that criteria to the, the program that we just heard about, it lowers the administrative burden, which means more people are going to get helped. It can be you know, applied to all the communities that have you know, either organized or not that we know are struggling with their property tax bill. And I feel like trying to you know, push this program that we always knew was so narrowly confined, just it doesn't solve the problem that we know exists. And so I'm just frustrated um, because I think there is a solution. The solution is to do what we heard about at a much more aggressive level because it hits everything we needed to hit. And it, it, it hears what residents are saying that have come from Walltown, that have come from Bragtown, who have said, you know, we need some serious help here. And so I just wanna name my frustration because I think what we're, ta what we're doing right now is just forcing this conversation um, and it doesn't get the relief that we know we need. So I have one thought. Um, I'm sorry, Councilmember Middleton didn't mean no, to- go, I'll yield, Mr. Mayor. If you, uh... This is a this is one thought that I have. Um, I wonder if an idea of since the county commission is is meeting. Um, I don't know if they have another work session prior to their budget uh, passing their budget, but one possibility might be for us to, if we so choose, to pass a motion asking them to extend the you know formally asking the county to increase their AMI level to 60%, which would be a huge increase in the eligibility. Um, and it would, um, yeah, so that's one thought I have, you know, is to, is to as, as Councilman Caballero said, lean into this. I think that would be one way of doing that, uh, is for us to make a formal request and then tell them that we would be willing to, uh, you know, from our end, uh, do what is necessary, especially in the first year. Um, apparently, um, the um, according to how I heard the county, the ARP funds are are, are an eligible uh, is an eligible use. So uh, that's one thought that I have. Um, and I'll now uh, ask, uh, let, me, let me just say also, I'm gonna be leaving in a few minutes. Um, I only have one higher priority than this, um, and that's to meet my new granddaughter. So I'm gonna take that opportunity for the first time. Um, but uh, I'll, uh, Council Member, Council Member Middleton. I see Mr. Mayor, you touched on the AMI question, raising the AMI, I'll, I'll yield. No problem, thank you. All right. Other thoughts, colleagues at this time? Council Member Freeman. Thank you. I just want to know how that impacts our current application and the folks who are seeking relief this year, because I believe the conversation with the counties for 21-22. And so that's not going to take effect this year. True. Which is why I think it's, it's probably most, um, even though it could cause the defensibility issue, I think it's important that we take that stand acknowledging how um, even if Crest Street were included in that conversation or, <clears throat> or other neighborhoods, it's specific to the issue of who's been experiencing the gentrification. Because I think even right now in Crest Street, the one unit for $60,000 is not likely to stay, stay on the market very long. Um, 
this is a this is a pressure that most of the low income homeowners are facing, especially in communities of color. And I think we are we're trying to solve all of the problems when this specific one was brought to us by Walltown and you know Bragtown. And I I I, I truly appreciate the counsel of our city attorney's office. But I think on this one, it's important that we do take a stand, acknowledging that the previous parameters may have cost some folks their homes. And I, I really would like to do something this year. So I just want to share that piece. That's all. Thank you. And I, I share your concern. Other thoughts, colleagues? Anybody have a way out of this conundrum? Council member, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't know that I have a way out of the conundrum, but um, given that the application process is already ongoing um, for 2021 taxes, uh, it seems like the administration um, could take some time to figure out expanding the program for the next round um, of taxes. And we could consider a citywide program that would begin. Um, that would begin with 2022 taxes. That doesn't solve the immediate problem, um, but it does give us a a way forward um, and a and a path to resolving the administrative um, concerns. And at the same time, we could continue to impress upon the county um, that we really feel that the community needs more relief than they're currently offering, and change our plans if that county relief program which would of course would which would be better than what we could do if that if that county relief program were to be adopted then we could then change our plans um but that in the absence of that that we should consider moving forward with the citywide program for the next tax year thank you mayor pro tem other comments Councilman Freeman. Just a point of clarification, Mayor Pro Tem, are you suggesting that we don't do anything this year to change it? Yeah, I'm suggesting that we leave the program as is this year um, and that we pursue an expanded program for next year. So the application period for this year is already open. Um, and it would be around the same time next year that people could apply for the expanded program. Madam Manager. I would uh, inter interject at this time that we have a plan to bring um, the results of this year's program uh, to the council after your um, vacation, like we did last year. So because as Reginald mentioned, when he came on, um, when he spoke earlier, this year was the one year extension. And it was at the time that you saw the results of last year that you added the extra year uh, on to the pilot. So that is why we are actually in this year with an application process open. Uh, so it's kind of like we're right now in the middle of, you know, we, we, we're in the middle of a process, but we would be bringing the results of how this process, how many people applied, how many grants, that whole report, that will be coming in the, you know, in the fall, as soon as you all are back from vacation and that analysis can take place. So that would be a time to discuss what happens next for the program that we actually are administering under some fairly specific guidelines that were voted on by the council, which, you know, which certainly can change, but that's what currently, currently exists. Thank you, Madam Manager. Um, Mayor Pro Tem. I'm going to turn over the chairing to you. Okay. And uh, I'm sorry, I know we have a couple of other important topics that I'm not going to be here for, which I hate to miss. Um, but I'll look forward to hearing uh, any uh, decisions that you all made or uh, any discussions that you had. I'll be, uh, I'll, be, I'll be checking back in about that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Give, give her lots of kisses for us. <laughs> I definitely will. And a few pictures. And a few pictures for sure. Thanks, or it didn't happen. <laughs> See you all in a little bit. Bye. Um, all right, we'll continue uh, this discussion. Council Member Freeman. 
I was just going to make a suggestion that maybe in the in light of what um, Madam Mayor, uh, Madam Mayor, I'm sorry, what Madam Manager Page mentioned is that we just open the application so we can see who would apply, and then that way we can come back to it on the other side of this, based on what she shared around um, by August having some information. Because the problem is that if we don't allow folks to apply, then we can't see what the problem is or how we might be able to alleviate, how much of a problem we might be able to alleviate. So it could be very small or it could be really large, but just allowing everyone to apply and like not excluding folks um, in the process. So we have like a, a kind of data point to say folks have submitted, but they don't qualify, so to, so to speak. Um, so Madam Manager. I, I would just respond to that, uh, council members. When we have an, you know, an open so that you know anyone can apply, you actually have to have an infrastructure to accept those applications and process it. So as Mr. Johnson referenced, it's not who actually gets the check at the end, it's, it's what comes in on the front that we really would have to staff. So I just want to make sure that that is part of the conversation um, I know that Mr. Johnson, during the process, he actually um, assigns 50% of a person's time um, for the whole application period, and that is to process about 40 applications. So it is the, it is the work that actually takes place to process the applications, you know, not, not the result that we get or the data that we collect from that process. Madam Mayor Pro Tem, if I could follow up. Just noting, ahead, just noting earlier how we were having the conversation about, you know, acknowledging how our, you know, first responders in our call center, you know, could use this support. I think it's similar, similar conversation right now and acknowledging like if our um, community development department needs additional support, I think in, in light of COVID and the experience um, hardship that folks are facing and paying their taxes, it would be really responsive of us to use ARP funds to support even a temporary um, staff addition or temporary staff shifting um, to just make sure that as many applications could be received as possible. Thank you, council member. Um, I'm concerned personally that we would have people apply for a program that we are not intending to give them, we're not attending to give them the benefit this year. Um, that seems, I, I don't know that that would um, help the situation. I don't do other, I'm not sure where to, I don't feel like we have clear direction to staff about what to do here. Um, does anybody have a proposal that we could consense or at least have a majority agree to for how to move forward? Council member Middleton. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I think in the absence of any proposal, I think holding, uh, and I think it was intoned earlier, it may have been by you, where we are now. I think the mayor floated the possibility of considering uh, a resolution uh, asking the uh, county uh, to go to 60% AMI, kind of an incremental approach. Uh, I, do, I do think that uh, opening an application process with no money attached to it may create uh, expectations that we're really not ready to, to fulfill right now. If we've, you know, and there might be a better way to kind of research, uh, if need be, what, you know, what the, the need or, or uh, desire for the program is. But I, I think absent any um, new recommendations, I'm, I'm comfortable with holding as is uh, for another year. And uh, the manager says she's going to come back uh, with uh, uh, results in the program, we'll have more information, more data. Uh, we can also consider asking our friends at county about the AMI as well. So I, I, you know, I don't think we have to come up with anything on the spot right now. I'm, I'm comfortable with the earlier recommendation of holding where we are. Thanks. Um, can I see thumbs up if that feels like a good way forward? All right, I got four four thumbs up and one thumbs down. So um, we're going to go ahead and do. That we'll look forward to hearing from the staff um, after the break with a report from this year's program and more conversations about expanding the program citywide. And we will, um, I'll check in with the mayor about how to get that resolution to the county in advance of their budget adoption about raising the 
um, the AMI for their program up to the 60%. Um, our next topic is council pay and council member Freelon. I believe you had some thoughts to share on that. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I'll be very brief. Uh, we talked earlier during the kind of um, uh, funding the council uh, priorities uh, about the merits of increasing um, city council member pay to full time instead of part time to reflect the nature of the work. Um, I think there was, if I recall, there was general consensus around that. There was just the suggestion that we kind of push it back to 2023, which is when the current folks who are just reelected term would end. So folks would get a chance to vote people out for giving themselves a raise. Um, I thought that was a great idea. And then uh, was thinking this year, actually, that that, that delay would create a, um, a delay in equity in our potential candidate pool. We have an election coming up this year. So I talked to some colleagues about it. Uh, I talked to Mayor Shul, Javier gave me a call uh, and came up with a really cool suggestion, props to Javier, which was that, what if we uh, did an amendment where we did the raises for the ward seat and the mayor this year, since their seats are up. Um, and then the folks who, are in the at-large seats that raise could be delayed to 2023 as originally discussed. It still honors the spirit of like, we're not giving ourselves raises. Anyone who votes for this can have an opportunity to, you know, meet the voters about that choice. Um, and it, uh, but it, it allows us to have equity in our candidate pool this cycle instead of waiting two years um, so it's like a staggered, same idea, just a staggered approach, uh, which was slightly different from what I emailed. So I appreciate the suggestion from Javiera and just wanted to offer that uh, to colleagues to consider. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Um, I think the first thing we should do is check in with our city attorney about that, because I know previously we've had conversations about pay about how we're able, how we're allowed to do pay for different folks. And it was communicated that we had to all be paid the same. The separation between ward and at large might make a difference in that, but I'm not sure. Um, so if somebody from our city attorney's office could give us their quick opinion on that, that would be great. Or let us know that you need a little more time to research it. Sorry for putting out on the spot. Um, may I proceed? Yes, please. Thanks. Um, Krista Kuko, City Attorney's Office. Um, I apologize. I was here to speak on behalf of the previous item. Um, and so this is not a question that I am prepared to speak to, um, but I will pass this along to others in our office and make sure that we're able to get an answer for you. Thank and you. Appreciate it. Just to add to that, we did reach out to the city attorney and, and she had a conflict with, so was not able to, um, uh, to come to this meeting, but as well, uh, um, budget staff, and, and I assume the city attorney's office was not aware of this particular unique proposal. So we're not prepared to comment at this time. Thank you. Understood. Um, so Council Member Caballero and then Council Member Freeman. Yeah, I just wanted to share that I suggested it because half of us aren't up. And so it felt that you know, the, the original intent was that everyone would be able to face an election before that decision was made, which is why I suggested to divvy it up because we're on staggered terms. Um, that does not mean it's legally <laughs> allowed, but that's why um, I had suggested it. Thank you, Council Member Freeman. Thank you. I would just like to just note that I would much rather focus on base pay for staff than for council. And just acknowledging the conversation we had earlier, I would much rather direct funds in that direction than to myself, um, regardless of an election uh, or um, whomever was in the seat. I think the way that we have it set right now, based on uh, all that's going on, it's it's sufficient. And if we were to talk about 2023, that might be a different conversation. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. This is a really important um, discussion. And I, 
I can do this because I can do this because the way my life is configured. And I think it's incredibly important that we expand the pool of folk who can choose to do this um, based upon, you know, a, a living wage and the salary. So this isn't about me personally. I'm thinking about the office, the position. I'm not, obviously none of us are going to be here forever. So this is about posterity and, and folk uh, coming behind us. Um, I, and I appreciate uh, uh, Councilor Caballero's um, recommendation, kind of the staggering thing. I too have questions about the legality of it. I like the idea of 2023, giving everybody a chance to get fired um, before it kicks in. In terms of kind of capturing the, 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 the exigency of equity, as things go, this really isn't an emergency to me. I mean, there are some other things I think we could have leaned in harder on if in the name of equity and, and doing it quickly, the AMI thing, the, there's any number of things. Uh, I think that would have taken precedent over salaries for the council. While it's an important issue, I just don't, I just don't feel the urgency that we got to do it now because of this upcoming um, uh, election cycle. One thing is that while we might, we could kind of stagger it for folk in the election pool, one thing we cannot overcome is the power of incumbency as well. Th th there's a built-in advantage to incumbency. So even though, you know, those of us that are running would have a chance to be fired just by definition, um, that doesn't guarantee a win, obviously, but there is an advantage to incumbency. So it, 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 it could kind of look like, well, you know, you're giving yourself a raise at a year when the odds are 40 because you're an incumbent. So I kind of like the 2023, uh, 2023, it, it kicks in after the second group of us were at large have had gone through an election cycle with folk knowing that the next group of people will start getting paid uh, uh, at a higher rate. So I would certainly um, support the the 2023 after you know an election uh, of all of us so everybody who votes for this now will have had the opportunity to face the voters removed kind of a a, a cycle a whole cycle removed not the cycle that you're in at that moment but a whole cycle removed and no one can say that it kicked in uh during the time so even if we vote for it now those of us who are in office now we vote for it if we get reelected or if we decide to run for re-election we still don't benefit from it so there's still distance uh, between that and, you know, because we had the benefits of incumbency or whatever, and in 2023. So that's a long way of saying, I think it's an important move. Um, it's kind of weird for us to be pushing, you know, living wage, you know, for everybody else, but folk who, the only folk who can have these jobs are folk who, you know, are in a position in life where they can kind of, I think, I think there's something uh, incongruent about that. Uh, but I think we also be careful. Uh, also have to be careful that we're not looking like we're self-aggrandizing or self-dealing. And I think that uh, pushing it to 2023 addresses all of those issues. So I would support it. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Mayor. Council. Thank you, Council Member. Just one thought I had while you were speaking is that for those of us who are in at-large seats, it will be the next election for us. So if we run and are reelected in 2023. That's our next election where we would still have the benefit of incumbency. Our next one then wouldn't it be a whole cycle removed would be would be 2027, which seems like I'm down for 2027. That seems like the next century to me. <laughs> I can't imagine 2027. Um, Councilmember Freeline. Yeah, I just want to, uh, you know, and it's easy for me to say because I'm not uh, running for election this year, but. Um, you know, the questions about incumbency, about appearances, and about, uh, you know, the, those are much less concerned to me than, than making sure that folks who are eligible to run but will choose not to because of this equity issue will not run. And it, it, there seems to be kind of broad acknowledgement about that. Then there's the consideration of the political consequences. I think, like, you know, the other thing, too, I remember talking with this years ago. I think Jilly and I, I don't, I don't remember if we discussed this or not, like way back in, in 17, I was just kind of curious about, oh, what's it like on council? How do you make ends meet? And, uh, you know, since I brought it up earlier this year, there hasn't been like this kind of public outcry. People haven't hit our inbox saying like, y'all are trying to enrich yourselves. I think there's a pretty clear equity argument that can take the wind out of the sails of that critique. It's not about us. It's not about filling our pockets. It's about getting equity in our candidate pool 
uh, which is important. What well, I think, which is important to all of us, everyone said that it's important to them. So, you know, obviously my preference would be to move now instead of wait, but uh, I'll, I'll move with the, with the body, of course. And, you know, there's five of us here, so we can vote and see how it goes and whichever way it'll either be this year, or it'll be 27 or some somewhere in between. So I'll be happy that I was able to set the wheels in motion at some point. Um, I just think it should be sooner than later. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, given that two of our body are missing, I don't feel comfortable proceeding with a vote right now. I'm wondering how folks feel about adding this to the end of our work session that we're going to have later today. Um, I'd like to get it resolved today just so our staff has the guidance that they need, but I'd rather wait until everybody can be part of the conversation. Councilmember Caballero. Yeah, I just wanted to say I'm, I'm open to having that conversation. I agree that there's two folks missing, and so I don't feel good about making a determination. I think that if we land on January 23, which is what we had originally gone to, then that just needs to be communicated now, right? As far as for folks who are running this year, and then for folks who are running in 23, granted any council that comes after us could choose to revoke that, that is their uh, prerogative, um, but that there is an intent uh, by this body to pay council members. And I think a living wage of 40, which is kind of depressing, um, I think it was like $35,000 a year. So it is not a, a huge amount of money and we, that will have to be discussed and how, you know, whatnot. But I also want to say that this is a conversation that's happening in many places. You know, we were a more rural, uh, more rural, less populated state. And so when these systems were first created, obviously a lot of racism and classism built in, but additionally just less people. Uh, it was shocking to me that the city of Pittsburgh that has 300,000 people, which is the same as Durham County, has a uh, council system where council members make way beyond a living wage and actually can't work in other jobs. Uh, once they take the seat, they have to let go of their other employment. And it was just interesting to see that observation of a, you know, that the city of Pittsburgh in the 70s had 750,000 people. So they are a city that has decreased in population, yet their political system has stayed the same. And, and they, and, um, I think it's New Hanover County and both the city of Charlotte Council has recently tackled this issue, acknowledging that it is absolutely an equity issue. Thank you, council member. Um, so I think I saw some nods and thumbs up for having this, continuing this conversation after the work session. Great, uh, thanks y'all. Um, and our last item is shot spotter. Council member Middleton, would you like to take that and take us away on that? Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. I appreciate it. And let, let me, it, it, I think the listing is a bit misleading because when I brought the issue up, it wasn't shot spotters free, uh, freestanding. It was actually bundled with the NCCU recs as well. Um, and an update on the NCCU recs, shot spotter was bundled in that. Um, I remember, I, I do recall getting an update about a memorandum of understanding for expanded jurisdiction between our police department and the NCCU police department, but there were some other things that NCCU had spoken about, uh, some traffic calming measures, uh, a dummy police car, a uh, 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 couple of other things that NCCU had spoken of. Um, let me, let me, and and I see, uh, Madam Manager, did you wanna chime in now and, and I'll, I'll yield and then. Yes, I would just say that we, we certainly are um, available to make an oral update on all five of those requests. Uh, we've discussed it internal. Uh, Ms. Wallace is prepared to, to do that. Uh, but we we thought the you know budgetary item was the shot spotter, which is why we placed it on this particular agenda. But we are prepared to do to do either. Thank you so much, Madam Manager. And and the time is upon us, so I, I won't uh, press unless my colleagues want to press that. Um, I, I wanted to and I do not intend, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, to, to necessarily press uh, for up or down vote today. We have a new police chief coming in. I think it would be good for our new police chief to kind of ha have a chance to look at our overall strategy in terms of combating uh, gun violence. But I did want to raise the issue because uh, uh, I want to sort of channel and give voice uh, to the anxiety that a lot of people in our city are feeling. And there's a lot of converging things. One, police chief departing. Uh, two, issues with 911, three, gunfire going up, four, we're getting ready to go on vacation. Uh, and when we pass the budget, we're gonna be doing victory laps, rightfully so, for a new department 
uh, of public safety focused on pilots for mental health responders that a whole lot of people in our city are excited about, but don't really feel like that it's addressing the issue, which is gun violence. We know that as, as the temperatures go up, uh, as our kids uh, have less to do, they're, they're out in the street, that, that uh, some feel that we haven't spoken directly to the actual issue of gunfire. We, we've spoken, and I'm excited about uh, uh, you know, uh, guaranteed income as a possibility, violence interruption, violence interruption. But as I said, you know, years ago when the city dispatched me as a delegation, part of a delegation to Boston, what well, we came back and and uh, just to put it clear, shot spotter has gotten kind of been a shiny object that's gotten a lot of attention from folk, and it's kind of been the thing that this hot button issue. But it's ancient technology that we've been talking about for a long time uh, in Durham. I didn't start the conversation; it was Mayor Bell actually. Uh, who started the conversation back in the day. And, and back then the issue was funding, how expensive it was, not you know uh, some of the other issues uh, uh, we've been discussing today. So what, what we observed uh, in Boston were violence interruption. It was a trifecta, violence interruption, shot spotter, wraparound services, massive community investment. So it, it really, it, it's interesting how um, controversial it is now because it, it's really in some of the most um, progressive cities in our country. I'm talking about cities that aren't even tripping over weed or LGBTQ rights. I mean, they, they you know, they, they settled those issues a long time ago. These are progressive bellwethers who, who have integrated this technology into an overall strategy, which includes a wraparound services and violence interruption. So when this was presented, it was presented as part of a multifaceted comprehensive plan that's been shown to be effective in cities like Boston, which the Justice Department had lifted up at that time for um, the successes they had in the reduction in gun violence and the improvement of relationships between communities uh, and police. So, so I, I, I brought it up because I want folks that are watching this debate who are in our city, who, are, who watch us getting ready to go on vacation, who watch you know, us in the process of getting a new police chief, who are concerned about these 911 issues, just to kind of uh, uh, let them know it's gonna be all right and to lessen fear and anxiety because there's a whole lot of folk in the city and, uh, who think that we, we just, you know, we're focusing on some areas, but we just don't get it in other areas. And I want them to know that we do get it uh, and, and that we do care. So uh, I'm not going to call for up or down votes. I think ultimately we do um, need to have an up or down vote. And I know we've dealt with shots about it before, but the up or down vote in this particular case is the particular offer from ShotSpotter. And I've reached out to folk at ShotSpotter uh, and they are internally uh, uh, reviewing to see if the, uh, uh, if the offer will still be uh, extended. I think there's amenability to it. So, um, you know, we took a, long, a lot of time and we didn't get back with an official vote on the up or down on ShotSpotter. But I'll end with this. There are three reasons uh, uh, why I think that a pilot uh, as part of a comprehensive plan uh, to address gun violence in our city would be a good thing. First uh, is the potentiality of saving lives. Uh, uh, if help comes when folk are hurt, there's a higher chance that they'll get medical attention to save their life. If nobody calls when something happens, there's a higher chance you'll bleed out. Uh, I believe that ShotSpotter could be useful in deploying life-saving interventions to folk that have been shot and who are bleeding out and nobody called because we now have a, a number of communities in our city where folk have been sensitized or desensitized to gunfire, they don't call the police. Secondly, uh, I believe it can uh, lessen response time. Um, and by that, I mean, when a sensor uh, uh, goes off, um, rather than come to your house to ask you where the fire, shot was fired, um, it can deploy folk directly to the scene where the shot uh, went off. Thirdly, I think it can muscularize our investigative capabilities. The quicker we get there, the, the higher the ability, the probability of, of, of recovering shell casings, uh, folks that might be still in the area. I think those three reasons uh, are, are worthy of a pilot. Um, and whatever happens, what I plan on doing my, uh, with part of my summer is um, if, we, if we're not gonna do shot spotter, uh, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the city to have shot callers. Um, I'm gonna spend my summer encouraging every single person in this city that hears gunfire to call 911. I, I think we should, we should, you know, we should create uh, with humans uh, the condition uh, that electronically would be created. Because here's what I know. Uh, one of the concerns about uh, ShotSpotter from a tactical and strategic point of view is that the minute those sensors are turned on, one of two things are gonna happen. Nothing 
or there's going to be this explosion of data. Um, and, and why is that going to happen? Because we will now have a full assessment of just how big a problem it is. And that could be overwhelming. But here's the problem. If we know that there's going to be this huge explosion of data, then we are tacitly admitting that we understand the, the scope of the problem. And now we have to look at residents and citizens and say, you know what, if we document it, we got to address it. And not documenting it, uh, uh, does that let us off the hook? I don't believe it does. I mean, the gig is up. We know that there's gunfire in our city every night, uh, whether people call or not. So, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna uh, encourage folk uh, to be shot callers. I'm gonna encourage folk to, to don't take it for granted in your neighborhood uh, that every single time you hear gunfire, you should call 911. Um, and it's gonna create, because that's what shot spotter does is when gunfire goes off, it calls the police. So if we don't wanna do it electronically, I'm gonna encourage every human being in this city, no matter what your neighborhood is, uh, uh, where you live, what time of day or night it is, don't brush it off. Don't just say, oh, that's how life is in my neighborhood. Call 911 and let's see what happens to our, 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 our data collection uh, then, because I believe they deserve the same type of responsiveness as other neighborhoods uh, in our city. So I brought it up uh, because you know people still getting shot. That's why I brought it up. And, and I also brought it up in, in context of the central recommendations, but I'm not, I'm not calling for an up or down vote today or any budgetary uh, uh, issues, but I do want to put it on radar as we get ready to go on vacation. I want people to know that we still get it. It's still on our radar. It's still before us. And as we take victory laps over our new department, I'll certainly take a victory lap over our new public safety department, but it's going to be a muted celebration for me because the headline in Durham is gunfire. That, that's our localized data point. That's what's happened. That's what people are thinking about as the weather is changing and, and, and our kids are playing in the streets. Um, that's what the issue is. So I, I look forward to working with Pierce on, on, on organizing and rallying black men uh, and boys. I look forward to working on the Thousand Black Men Initiative um, this summer and also encouraging people to do uh, what's taken for granted in other neighborhoods um, and what would not be tolerated in other neighborhoods where it's going on at the level uh, in the city. Um, I know it wouldn't. I live in one of them. So, 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 uh, so that's it, uh, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. I, I, I just wanted to, um, to give voice to the anxiety and concern of some people uh, in the city, a lot of people in the city who think that our eye is not on the ball, that we're focused on one aspect, but that we're not focused on gunfire, and also to uh, uh, express that I believe that a new police chief should have an opportunity uh, to do a comprehensive review of our strategy. But at some point, I do believe that we need to uh, say yes or no uh, for the record. Uh, that we are going to um, um, accept a free pilot. We're doing all these other pilots, except a free pilot, which I think could potentially save the lives of our children. Uh, there's nothing less at stake for me uh, than this pilot. So this is why, why I keep talking about it. And I'll stop talking about it when the gunfire ceases. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Council Member. Um, so Madam Manager, if you are willing, um, to do that quick report on the central recommendations now, I think that would close out this item and we could uh, have a few minutes before we come back at one. Okay, uh, it will be brief. I just realized that uh, Ms. Wallace is watching uh, on the live stream and not actually in, um, in, in the Zoom uh, meeting, but we did the NCCU presentation <clears throat> included uh, five, rec five recommendations to us. Uh, one of them was shot spotter. That is the one that we just spoke about. Uh, the other four were um, other items as council member Middleton just spoke about. Uh, we had the extended jurisdiction agreement uh, with North Carolina Central to allow their police department to patrol anywhere their sworn officers can patrol off campus, which includes anywhere uh, within the corporate limits of the city of Durham. Uh, as well as an enhanced um, reconnection of the relationship between the chief, uh, the chief here uh, for the city of Durham, as well as the chief of police at um, North Carolina Central. We met with the chancellor about having uh, just a car, the what was called a dummy police car. That was one of the requests. And we had a conversation with the chancellor and his team, um, led primarily by Chief Davis, 
uh, as well as uh, Chief uh, Williams at North Carolina Central about that probably not being a good uh, implementation of a, of a safety measure at this point in time. And the university agreed that we would not implement that, implement that policy. There was another recommendation that um, one of the um, staff members in the chancellor's office, Michael Page, be added to the Community Safety and Wellness Task Force. And that response was that there would be some, um, some advisory committee members that would be uh, part of the Community Safety and Wellness Task Force. And that was actually added to the bylaws. Uh, and North Carolina Central University has one of those, uh, one of those spaces. And the final um, part of the recommendation related to uh, traffic calming. And we actually did have a pretty robust uh, conversation uh, this week about where we are with the traffic calming. And I won't go into the details here on that, but it's, it's certainly uh, that has been, um, you know, that's, that's been ongoing since we had the, uh, the, the last update to the council and progress is certainly being made. Um, Ms. Wallace is going to actually uh, do a written update uh, to those recommendations, and we will transmit that update uh, to the mayor and council. Thank you so much. Uh, any other comments, comments or questions from council? Councilmember Middleton. Thank you, Madam Mayor Tim. I see uh, Chief Davis's box. I'm wondering if she's uh, on, uh, if she's available. Uh, for a question, I see her uh, box and her name. I don't know if she's. Hey, Chief, how are you? Hey, I'm good. How's everybody today? Doing well, thank you, Chief. Good to see you. I know you're winding down. Uh, so congratulations, yeah. boxes and stuff. So I wanted to ask you a quick question. You're going, um, you're going to be assuming the leadership of Memphis. Uh, the Memphis Police Department. Um, does, does, Memphis, does Memphis use ShotSpotter? Um, yes, they do. They just recently rolled out the ShotSpotter program. And um, as a matter of fact, um, during my visit, I had an opportunity to visit the Real Time Crime Center and um, ShotSpotter, the actual display was up. And I had an opportunity to really see it work in action. A couple of shootings occurred while I was there, um, which, which was which was really neat to be able to see. I've never seen, you know, shot spotter in the works, so it was really neat to be able to see how um, the response was. As um, it was not just one, but there were two shootings that occurred, and um, the level of response, how quick the response was as well. Um, to be able to see the mapping of it. And, um, uh, and of course, it, it hadn't been in effect long enough, I guess, to have any real evaluation of it just yet. But um, the, the team there um, just spoke about the last, you know, month or so that, it, that it's been rolled out that they have been able to communicate better. Uh, not just um, from the real-time crime center to the officers on the street, but the officers on the street to the community members as well. Is this something that you plan on uh, keeping or integrating into your, your long-term strategy and your leadership in Memphis? Do you, do you see it as something that may be a value to you, value to you as you assume command? Um, I do. Uh, of course, uh, the heavy lift is already done there. Um, they have it... Um, on a three mile radius of footprint that is, um, you know, the smaller footprint in one of their most impacted areas um, with gunfire. Um, I think it's the White Haven community, but um, it's still early to, to see what community's feedback has been, but um, I'd be interested to, um, you know, find out too uh, because I know that has been part of the conversation here. You know, how will the community receive, you know, the response um, from police officers? And and uh, to me, I don't think it's any different than just receiving the response from a call from service. 
you know, it's it's no different if somebody picked up the telephone and called the police every time they heard gunfire. You know, it'd be that same type of response. Well, that's what I was going to ask, because part of our debate here in, in Durham, there seems to be this impression that there's a qualitative difference in the type of response. Like if a human being picks up a phone and dials 911 and says, I hear gunfire, is there as opposed to an electronic sensor saying, I hear gunfire, is there like an adrenaline spike for an officer from a, an electronic sensor as opposed to a, a human that differentiates their response posture? I mean, I'm a lay person, but it seemed to me gunfire, gunfire is gunfire as, as far as, I'm just, I wanted to ask you about the difference. Yeah. Is there a difference in, in the... There, there, there's no difference because officers are trained to respond to gunfire, you know, the same way, the same precautions, the same type of communication, um, you know, it, there, there's no difference between a person picking up telephone saying they, they hear gunfire and the gunfire coming, you know, through um, the technology of a shot spotter uh, system. Um, you know, a lot of the shootings that occur just, you know, occur under the radar, sort of uh, off the grid, which at times, you know, a lot of, a lot of gunfire goes unreported, it's become normalized, so to speak. And I think that's more concerning to me than, you know, um, a lot of the other dialogue that, that we've had, that people have gotten to a point where it's just normal, but it's not normal in every community. So I feel, you know, um, comfortable just saying that some of the, um, the issues that could be addressed would, would demonstrate a little bit more concern that, you know, we don't want any community to experience gunfire. And as you say, um, go through these exercises that some community members have um, uh, taken part in for, for some time now. So, um, you know, the lack of response to me sometimes seems like, you know, it's okay to, for it to be normal. So um, in Memphis, I plan to um, continue to evaluate and listen to the community as well. Um, I can't imagine a community, and, and I guess, you know, I haven't heard it yet. I know some of, some of your colleagues probably have um, various opinions about it, but I haven't heard community members say that they don't want police officers to show up when they hear gunfire. Um, as on the contrary, they do want them to be there. And I'll use um, our our wonderful community, McDougal Terrace, that experienced so much gunfire at one time that um, the soft presence of officers in that community, that model has um, changed that community. I'm going to knock on wood, but we don't hear near as many um, about near as many shootings as we've done as we've had in the past. Um, it used to be one of, you know, are real hot spots, but uh, building relationships and having a soft presence of officers have allowed children to be able to play on playgrounds. And, um, you know, I think we, we, we should pay attention to empirical data that supports um, healthy communities and what that really looks like. And I, and I think we, we kind of got that right. But um, I do support any kind of technology that will help us save the lives of um, individuals or at least identify and help uh, support investigations with leads by collecting, you know, the evidence on, on scenes of crimes. Uh, thank you, Chief. And, and finally, and, and I, uh, I, I appreciate that because I, you know, I want to, I want to really be faithful and, and keep faith with, you know, the values of Durham. This is Durham. You've been in Durham for a while and, and I respect deeply um, the concerns that have been raised and the questions that have been raised. You know, we're not enemies. These are allies and friends that we're having this debate with. And, and I take their concerns seriously. I, I wanted to ask you one final question, though, about the, the whole thing about over-policing um, relative to response or, or shots fired or, or cops surging in for... And again, this isn't... For me, you know, it, it takes a human being to say, I see a kid wearing a hoodie or I see somebody, you know, carrying iced tea or Skittles or I see somebody drinking coffee in Starbucks. It takes a human. Um, sensors don't do that. They, 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 they're responding to the gunfire. I, I wanted to ask about this over-policing concern because for me, over-policing is, is not a numerical phenomenon. It's a cultural phenomenon. 
Um, no matter how many police you have in your city, their posture, we can still surge whatever number of police we have in a particular area and engage in over-policing. So it's not a numerical reality, it's a cultural, it's, it's, it's the attitude, it's the training, it's the yep. posture that they have when they show up that constitutes over-policing, mm -hmm. not the number uh, that you have. Um, and I think you've done a great job in, in, in helping us, not perfect of course, but helping to transform the culture of the police department. So are there concerns or do you think with you having shot spotters as part of your repertoire in Memphis, what is, and, and this might be kind of uh, echoing the, the, the previous question I asked, but are you concerned that responding to gunfire or knowing where gunfire is going off in your city is going to promote over-policing uh, when they're responding to gunfire? I'm, I'm, is that a concern that you have? No, not at all. Um... It's, it's not at all a concern, uh, especially when the community is asking for, you know, that presence and that visibility. You know, we work for the community. And if that's what the community is asking for, to um, find ways to make their community safer without it appearing to be an over presence of law enforcement. And, you know, and I think you know, talking about the model that, you know, has been established is one that is not an enforcement kind of response. It's one to assess a situation, to make sure that it's a safe, you know, um, scene. And then to check on the people who are experiencing the gunfire, you know, not necessarily hit by the gunfire, but I'm watching TV and somebody knocks on my door and said, ma'am, are you okay? You know, that's not over policing. I think that's what, you know, um, we've been trying to talk about getting to. How do we get police officers to have a humane approach to some of the problems in the community that exists? And um, I know that policing isn't the only answer um, it is, it, I think there should be a combination of other people, boots on the ground, you know, technology, uh, you know, a different culture in uh, how police respond to various types of incidents. Um, they're trained to respond appropriately when there is a threat. But when there is no apparent threat and they respond to gunfire, the shot spotter model is you're basically trying to build a relationship that we don't want this to be normalized. You know, we wanted to um, have you as a partner to help provide information. If you saw something, you know, we want to be able to stop, you know, this type of activity and we can't do it by ourselves. So instead of just ignoring the shooting, um, there's some type of collaborative effort to identify individuals who um, will, will, would perpetually, you know, commit these types of offenses. Well, thank you, Chief. That, that's all I have. And, you know, as I, as I uh, close, um, I have friends that we may disagree upon on shot spotter, but I, not one of them has said to me, it's a bad idea to call the police when you hear gunfire. No one, no one's ever said that. So I'm, I'm going to hope that maybe if not shot spotter, then we can partner this summer to, to just encourage everybody who hears gunfire to call. If we don't want to do it by shot spotter, then join me in 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 shot caller. Uh, uh, and every time you hear it, because our neighborhoods deserve better. Chief, God bless you. Good best wishes to you and your family as you move Thank into the you. people, residents, and citizens of, of Memphis. Looking forward to visiting with them uh, yeah. uh, soon, and I hope you'll keep us abreast on how you're doing. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I will. Oh, uh, thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Uh, any, that, that concludes our items. Is there anything else that anyone would like to comment on before we close? We've got one more thing to talk about, the pay during the work session. I think all of our other budget items have been resolved. Hey, John. Good afternoon. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. Mayor Pro Tem, I'm... <laughs> I hate to bring this up at the 11th hour, but it, it, it's on my mind. It can be really quick. Um, as we're getting an update on, um, oh, I guess we already got that update. I guess I wanted to, to check in one more time about We Are The Ones. 
to see where the city and the county is. Uh, I was just thinking about it as uh, Brother Middleton was talking about, um, you know, not just following up for, for updates on where things stand, but also the, the fact that we're going to be leaving this summer and summer is the time when violence has that annual uptick as it gets hotter outside. And that is one of those wraparound violence prevention initiatives that we've committed to funding a sliver of. And uh, if this is our last, last opportunity to get an updated, potentially fully fund, we are the ones. Uh, if it's ready for that, I would like an update on that too as well. Sorry to tag that in at the last minute. And it do sure. doesn't need to be today, but yeah. Okay, if, if it doesn't need to be today, is it all right if we don't do it today? Okay, um, great. So we can we can follow up with you about that, Councilmember Freeland. I know that there there is something for We Are the Ones in the budget, but it's not, it wasn't the whole request. So we can, um, maybe, I mean, God, we're trying to get this done today though, aren't we? <laughs> maybe, uh, John, could staff um, give us a report also at the work session on We Are the Ones? I'm sure we can provide you with an update on the program uh, by the time we, how about um, at the same time that we're, we get the update on the um, council pay. That sounds great. Thank you so much. No, um, thank you. And I'm so sorry for the late notice. I realized. It's okay. I mean, this is, this is the chance we got to, we got to get everything done today. It's, it's today or now or never. Um, also our, our summer break is just five weeks. So summer break is perhaps not, the best term. It's not, we're going to be on all summer. We're going to be gone a little over a month. Um, but of course the situation with gun violence is urgent all the time and more urgent in the summer. And so I do think it's important to think about these things now, um, but just want people to know we're not going to be like off to Bermuda for the rest of the summer. We'll be back uh, in on July 22nd. Um, and our last our last meeting before the break is June 14th. Uh, John, do you want to close us out? Very briefly, just uh, it's it's been uh, I, I just want to thank staff and the organization for their focus and persistence in what has been a very dynamic uh, budget uh, uh, process and also to the residents and to council. Thank you and thank you so much um, to you and our our staff. Um, Y'all have done an amazing job this year. And we've had a lot of, we've, we've got you as interim director, we've got Bertha up as interim deputy manager, we've got a new city manager and y'all have all jumped right in and done amazing work and we appreciate it very much. Council member Freeman. Just a point of clarification, are we not having a June 21st meeting? Did I miss something? June 14th. You're right, sorry. Monday, Monday the 21st is our, is our budget approval. And then we come back Thursday, July 22nd. So it's actually just a month this year. Yeah, no, I don't get through all my emails as timely as uh, other folks, but just making sure I didn't miss anything. Nope, you're good. June 21st. All right. Thanks, friends. Um, Council Member Caballero. Oh, you're just saving, you're just saying goodbye. Great. All right. <laughs> I am going to declare this meeting adjourned at 1234. PM and I will see you all in 20